Hey everybody, it's Word Balloon and John Suntress here. Holiday weeks are in motion. And uh, this is a weird time in the media where a lot of uh, people check out. And even, uh, you know, in, in uh, normal non-broadcast capacity, you know, people are kind of dead during the holidays. Well, not Word Balloon. Um, I figured it's the end of the decade. Everyone's doing their decade end list, all that stuff. I'm not going to do a best of decade, but I'm going to do some significant conversations that happened in the last 10 years on Word Balloon. And I hope you enjoy uh, these looks back because I think it gives us perspective of where we were where we are, where we're going. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy these conversations. As always, questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Uh, also, follow me on Facebook under my name, John Suntress, and the Word Balloon Network. I appreciate you listening to the show through the commercials. I know the commercials can be a pain, but uh, they do pay the bills. So please don't fast forward and listen to all the commercials before and after this message. There might be one more before we get started. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here, we are wrapping up the year, and uh, just in time to wrap up your last minute Christmas presents as well. And uh, rather than do a list of, uh, you know, the, the top stories of the decade that Word Balloon was involved with or covered, I wanted to give you a whole different uh, collage of different things that happened in the last ten years with Word Balloon. Um, I also, I have to admit, um, I was planning on having a bunch of new episodes to take us through the end of the year, but uh, had a little minor uh, medical setback last week. I'm okay. I want to stress that. Everything's fine. But they had to run some tests, so I lost a couple days with a a 24-hour, I guess, uh, 36-hour hospital visit. But uh, things wrapped up nicely, and uh, they just wanted to run some tests and keep me just in case anything was bad as far as a relapse of the infection, but uh, good news, pasta with uh, flying colors and antibiotics are knocking out whatever just cropped up, and you know, they said there might be setbacks throughout the year, this was the first big setback, and thankfully it was a small bump, so, but it, like I said, it knocked out a couple episodes that I had planned to do, we will reschedule and then talk to these people in January, good news is though, I got plenty of things I wanted to share with you again as we wrap up the decade. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with everybody else where it's like, well, isn't 2020 really the end of the decade? Isn't it from 11 to 20? Um, but whatever. Everybody likes round numbers. It's okay. So uh, we're going to start things off today with a look at Marvel's uh, involvement in media, which uh, took on big, big uh, you know, proportions throughout uh, the, uh, the teens, the tens, if you will, of the 20, uh, 21st century. And uh, a lot of it, we're talking with uh, Joe Casada. Three different conversations with Joe over the years, uh, starting in May 1st of 2011. Uh, then we will go to 2014 with a uh, San Diego Comic-Con conversation in the halls of San Diego, right before Guardians of the Galaxy opened up. And uh, who knew it was going to take the world by storm? Wouldn't you say that of all the Marvel movies uh, ending with Endgame, that uh, the biggest surprise and I think the biggest breakout of characters was clearly the Guardians of the Galaxy, Baby Groot, Rocket Raccoon. Uh, I mean, everybody knows these characters. Uh, Gamora, Starman, you know, Jesus. I, who the hell knew? I mean, this is this was the biggest, like, holy shit moment. Then we go a year later to Joe in August 3rd of 2015 to talk about more stuff. Not just Marvel movies, too. Uh, television and animation and, of course, the comics. And then we wrap up with the biggest shock of 2015, and that was the big announcement uh, that Kevin Feige and Marvel made that uh, the Marvel movie panel was uh, no longer going to be involved with uh, influencing uh, the scripts and direction of Marvel films. That was a big shocker, because I think we were all very secure in the idea that uh, you know the creatives on the comic book end were having good input. Um, nothing against Kevin Feige. I mean, to this day... Uh, non-disclosure agreements and, and uh, you know, those things have kept the real story from being out there. But uh, clearly there was uh, animosity between Ike Perlmutter, the, uh, you know, uh, main chief stockholder of Marvel, and Feige. And, and at first Perlmutter had a lot of influence on what kind of movies could be made and couldn't be made. And uh, had a uh, tight pull on the budget as well, apparently. And uh, would nix things that he felt were too costly. Uh, you know, Perlmutter is uh, allegedly quoted as saying that uh, women don't like superheroes, only men like superheroes. No, I don't want a Black Widow movie. Well, in, in uh, you know, obviously good news, we're getting a Black Widow movie because uh, Kevin Feige was able to go to the heads of Disney, and I'm paraphrasing 
what was said of the situation, but essentially pointed out to the heads of Disney, uh, I've made you $7 billion. I don't want to answer to this guy anymore. And they said, done. And so Kevin Feige got his full independence. We got, uh, you know, uh, from 2015 till Endgame, we got incredible Marvel movies. Uh, and and uh, obviously, you know, uh, Kevin Feige was able to go as big as he wanted to with all of these. And uh, we're still seeing the reverberations. We'll see what happens, obviously, coming up uh, with the movies that are already in development. Like I said, the Black Widow movie, the Doctor Strange movie, the Thor movie uh, with uh, Natalie Portman, Jane Foster taking over as Thor. Uh, I'm looking forward to all of it. I, I think it's great. Guardians 3, uh, a part, part of the plan as well, and uh, certainly Eternals. So it's going to be a very interesting time. But it's great to look back now and see all that stuff. Um, the reaction to the uh, dissolvement or dissolution of the Marvel movie panel is discussed with Brian Bendis in a great conversation uh, that I had with Brian uh, just a month after that last conversation with Joe uh, in September of 2015. And he couldn't say a lot. But I wanted to get his point of view of whatever he could talk about regarding uh, the end of the Marvel movie panel. We got about a half hour of conversation out of Brian uh, to talk about that. So that's what we're doing today. Conversations with Joe Quesada and Brian Bendis regarding uh, Marvel's involvement in um, primarily film, but also good television talk, animation talk, and the like as well. On today's Word Balloon. I hope you like it. Brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support. Via Patreon, it's the end of the year, and I thank you greatly for uh, everything you do, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is free. It'll always be free. But if you like what I do here and want to help out the cause, you can subscribe to Word Balloon via Patreon. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Click or click on the ad for Patreon on the front page of wordballoon.com. It will take you to my Patreon portal. Uh, is Word Balloon worth a dollar a month to you? Is it worth the price of a comic book a month to you? If you think so, and you can swing it, I appreciate the support and sponsorship from the League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. If you didn't know, Aftershock is having a big holiday sale on their online store. Everything on their online store is half-priced through the end of the year. Signed and graded comic books, graphic novels, convention variants, everything. Plus, you'll get free shipping on orders of $50 or more, uh, shipping within the U.S. only. You can use the code HOLIDAY at checkout. And think about it, man. These are, this is a great opportunity to dig into Aftershock's amazing library with uh, tremendous creators, Marguerite Bennett, Cullen Bunn, Donny Cates, Tim Seeley, uh, got Matthew Clickstein, Garth Ennis, so many great uh, creators and so many great books that are worthy of your attention. Go over there, go to their online store at aftershotcomics.com. Again, everything is half price through the end of the year. And if you live in the U.S., free shipping on orders of $50 or more. Check it out. All the deals are waiting for you at aftershotcomics.com. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. Some interesting conversations with Joe Quesada over the last 10 years. Starting things off on uh, May 1st of uh, 2011, a great talk. Uh, Joe, uh, comfortable in his office, reflecting on his first 10 years uh, as, uh, you know, the, the co-publisher of Marvel, with uh, starting with Bill Jemis, and then, of course, uh, you know, Joe taking over, editor-in-chief, and... Uh, Man, uh, I'll tell you, it was uh, it was a great conversation. Looking back and looking forward, lots of talk about the Marvel movie panel, about the Netflix uh, television stuff, animation, and of course the comics. Joe Casada from 2011 on Word Balloon. Joe, now four months in or five months in, you are solely the chief creative officer for Marvel. I'm wondering how different the job is for you from the non-comic side than, say, it was when Avi Arad had the position and you were observing how he was working, having that title. Well, you know, Avi did an incredible job when he was here at Marvel, um, but it was also a different company. We 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 didn't have uh, so many of the aspects to uh, that we have today. So, uh, you know, while, while Avi was was instrumental in in licensing out our movies, we we weren't really a movie studio. We weren't a television studio. Uh, we were dabbling somewhat in animation. Um, so Avi's Avi's real focus was in in, in building Marvel's uh, movie licensing program and, and making sure that those movies were the best movies they could be. And he did that with tremendous success. You know, I, I think I think you know, arguably, X Men and, uh, and 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 Spider Man, uh, you know, will, will be a crowning jewel for, for his achievements. He just, just did a fantastic job. Um, but we're we're in a different place now as a company. So um, it's 
there's a large part of what I'm doing now as, as chief creative officer that uh, I sit back and I realize, you know what, I, I kind of have to build this position and define what it is because it, it really is considerably different. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm operating very much as a conduit between all the creative divisions as Mar- Marvel and also a conduit between Marvel and, and Disney on, on many, many projects and, and, and occasions. So, uh, so it's a little bit different. You know, I, I, back when I was doing the editor-in-chief job, I could always look back on Stan Lee, for example, as a role model and say, okay, I know how Stan did things back in the 60s and early 70s. How can I adapt some of those things into my particular you know, time and place? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit different now with this position. It's it's uh, it, it's really it's really creating the role and defining the role, and uh, and hopefully I don't uh, smell up the joint too much. <laughs> what's a, what's a typical day like for you in this uh, sole role and not having to worry about maybe the day to day you know aspects of the monthly comics? You know, it, it, it's it, that's a, it's a funny question. It's even a funny question in the way that it's phrased because it's such a misnomer. I mean, there there is no typical day. <laughs> uh, that that's that's. It's 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 part of for me actually the the, the beauty of what I do because uh, I have such a such a short attention span that uh, <laughs> that if my days were all pretty much the same or had a routine to them uh, I might not be able to do it or at least do it to the best of my abilities but uh, my days are consistently different day in and day out my hours are always different day in and day out uh, you know every every morning before my day begins my wife has to grill me on exactly what am I doing because she can't keep track of uh, of where when I'm going to be, you know, during any particular day, because it isn't like, you know, Mondays are always the same and Tuesdays are always the same. Uh, it, it just shifts radically. So, you know, just just taking today for an example, you know, I I, I came in today and, and at noon I had a uh, I had a luncheon with all our interns, our outgoing class of interns, which is something that I do for every outgoing class, where basically they get to uh, pick my brains and, and ask anything about comics or you know school or art or anything. Uh, and then after that, I uh, I did a, a a big interview for uh, for for GQ of Japan, which just just uh, just happened a few minutes before you called, That's and now I'm on the phone with you. Uh, <laughs> then tonight I go home and. Uh, and I start working on a cover that I'm already laid on, uh, <laughs> as well as reviewing uh, two outlines for uh, new episodes of Ultimate Spider-Man, the cartoon we're working on at, mm-hmm. uh, for, for DXD. And, uh, you know, it just goes on and on. So it's uh, every day is, is radically different. And, you know, the, the one consistency is that, 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 that there's three things that are, that are basically con- uh, constants. Either I'm reading something, uh, drawing something, or interviewing about something. Uh, that, that, that pretty much happens at least once a day. Okay. And let's uh, let's before we get to animation and live TV, let's talk about the movie process because we've got yeah. Thor and, and Captain America coming up, and it's interesting. Um, I agree. Obviously, Avi really kind of changed the atmosphere and really helped organize. I think Marvel in terms of a movie entity, and it's that important bridge to now Marvel Studios and and, and Kevin yes. and you know being in charge. But it was interesting to watch uh, Daredevil this month on HBO, and I like. I, I should say, in particular, I really like the director's cut, but sometimes I think Daredevil is one of those kind of middle-of-the-road Marvel movies in terms of how it was received, and I think it was a little bit better than some people remember. And I, I was pleased to say, oh, you know, this thing still holds up really well. Um, but I but I wonder, uh, with Thor and now Captain America, and certainly we've seen it in the last few more movies, there's more there for the Marvel readers to really latch on to. And, and that certainly has changed. But how else would you identify how the how the movie process has changed well you know look let's face it we we are also learning from experience right Certainly. you know we're, you know the, the while, while while the successes are fantastic and and and, and we love them and and uh, we love having them uh the truth of the matter is that that from the movies that may not have been as big a success let's say something like iron man you 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 tend to learn more and you tend to learn you know what all right what what is that we definitely don't want to do and what is it that the audience is definitely not reacting to uh you know you'll find those you'll find those moments as well in even in our our great movies because they'll, they'll always be a moment where you go ah oh, you know that could have been better uh or it wasn't received in the same way that that we thought it would be received um but it, it's always a learning process and and i i think we're we're at a point now uh as we do these movies where we sit we sit back and we're like okay you know this particular scene in the screenplay, it's it's not working, and, and we have experience. It, while while we may feel it's okay, we've have experience in the past in some past movies where you know what that didn't work in the past, and there's nothing really telling me that it's going to work now. So so let's move on and try to fix these things. And uh, you know we're, we're we're really starting to understand what what you know what a Marvel movie really really is. More more importantly, what a what a what a Marvel fan and what a neophyte 
uh, is expecting and wants when they when they walk into a movie theater and they see that big red block start to flip those uh, those comic book <laughs> letters and images. Uh, you know, it, it's it, you know again, it's just, it's just a matter of experience and, and and the time that we spent in the trenches. And you know, you're working with real auteurs as well. I mean, uh, we're looking at Thor with Kenneth Branagh and stuff. And I, I was yeah. really excited when he was named because immediately I remembered his work on Henry V. Great Shakespeare mm-hmm. movie that has a lot of kind of battles, and even though it's Shakespearean time versus Norse mythology, I kind of saw a kinship there, and I thought, oh, this is the perfect guy for that. And you've got to obviously let the filmmaker make his movie while maintaining the consistency, as I've heard you say, uh, both on air and in uh, written uh, interviews, of what made these things Marvel successes. So tell me about that kind of balancing act when you work with directors, and studios for that matter. Yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 there's a certain kind of director that... that that would that works well at Marvel, and and it, it tends to be those that are very 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 collaborative, and and Kenneth falls into that category, uh, probably more than anyone that, that I've met currently. Uh, and this is no spot to all the uh, wonderful directors that have worked at Marvel movies, but Kenneth Kenneth really came in. And, and, and wanted to immerse himself in, in the world of Marvel. So, so much so that, um, that unbeknownst to me, I guess he, he was in New York. This, this is a little over a year ago. He, he was visiting New York and, you know, his assistant just called up and said, you know, Kenneth is in New York. He liked to pop by the publishing division. And, you know, usually when somebody does that, we get a heads up. You know, Marvel Studios may call us up and say, hey, listen, Kenneth is in town. He wants, he wants to tour, you know, put out all the bells and whistles. But no, Kevin just t- took it upon himself. I don't even think the guys at Marvel West knew that he was in town and wanted to tour. It was just an impulse by him, which, which I think was just fantastic. So he came up here and he, he just wanted to see how the comics were made and, 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 and wanted to meet the people here and, and see sort of the creative brain test trust that creates the comics that then, you know, he eventually reads and uses as source material. Um, and I found that fact, and he was, he's just such a lovely guy. And he sat for photos with everyone and just took his time. He was never rushed, uh, greeted everyone, shook everybody's hand, and, and he was just so inclusive. Of every, and, and people walked away going, this is going to be a great movie. I love this guy. Um, and, and he's been like that from the very, very start. Uh, but one of the things that we do at, at Marvel to, to, to maintain that Marvel consistency is that we have a, a small group of us, which is, you know, we've called the Marvel Creative Committee. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Creative Committee, we, we basically sit there, and, and as, as the screenplays come through, as, as, as ideas for the movies come through, just, just, just even the, the initial concepts, we sit there and we bat these things around uh, to make sure that they are intrinsically Marvel and, and, and fit into the vision of these characters and, and the Marvel Universe from the point of view of every division at Marvel, not just one particular division. You know, this is it working for, for, for the cinema? Is it working for the comics? Will it work for digital? Will, will all these things work? And, and, and you know, is, is, it, is the concept strong enough? Is it Marvel enough? Uh, so it's immensely collaborative, and, and that's why you need guys like, like Kenneth and Joe Johnston, you know, to come in and, and, and Joss and, and, and be mm-hmm. part of the process. Uh, but they know this going in. This, this isn't, you know, this isn't... Uh, this isn't, you know, a, a surprise to anyone. It's it's the way that we work, and it's the same way that we work with the comic books. You know, we 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 are very very collaborative as we plan out, you know, what the next year, two to three years of publishing is going to be, and then our writers go off and 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 they go do those things after after the big collaborative sessions. It's been a nice surprise to see already uh, in things like the Avengers cartoon, uh, the uh, I think the similarities to specifically Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and it's great. And I also think that there have been good creative decisions in terms of, again, you're dealing with a Y7 product, I guess, with with the Avengers cartoon and, and you know, how to how to soften things, but still kind of keep Marvel uh, continuity in there. In some ways, I like the choice of Hydra kind of elevating its uh relationship with Captain America going back to the Mm -hmm. 40s and I'm hearing you know rumors that maybe in the Joe Johnson interview that Hydra has a larger part in the in the film than say just specifically you know Nazis and and you know Mm -hmm. I I I, you know would you care to comment on that in terms of what you you know well the the only thing you know while while I'm not in the uh, in the business of giving out spoilers the the one thing that (laughs) that I I think is is very evident to, to to people who are are hardcore Marvel fans is how the, the comics are definitely being used as source material for these movies. And then consequentially, the, the movies are feeding back into the comic books. Uh, the animation is, is feeding from the comic books and the animation will eventually, you know, is, is also, is also getting fed by the movie division and we're, we're, we're adapting all these things. I mean, let's face it, Robert Downey Jr. gave such a quintessential performance for Tony Stark that, that I think he changed 
you know, he, he captured the essence of Tony Stark that was in the, in the comics, but then added this Robert Downey Jr. aspect to the character that, 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 you know, that is his right to do as, as the actor who's p- portraying the character. And it was so strong and so successful that I think you see that now permeating into, obviously, the animation with, with, the, with the voice choices. Uh, you see it permeating into the way that he's written in the comic books. You know, there, there's, a, there's a certain pattern to the character that now has been affected by Downey. Uh, so, you know, one thing affects the other. And I, and I think as long as those things are, are positive aspects, as long as we're not saying, hey, you know what, we're, we're, we're changing this character's costume in the comics because it's in the movie, as opposed to just saying, well, we're changing it because, you know what, it was so amazingly cool in the movie that we need to do something like that in the comics, um, then I think we're okay. You know, it's, yeah. it's uh, it, and, and that's, that's really the, the, as much, I hate using the word synergy, but unfortunately I, I haven't found a word yet that really describes it just right, but, I understand. but it's the kind of thing that, 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 that's happening now at Marvel. You're seeing one thing inspiring the other, inspiring the next. Um, and you're seeing our creators, even comic creators now, that are getting involved in all aspects of Marvel. Uh, and you need to look no further than the upcoming Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon, which we'll be we're developing right now for uh, for DXD. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. And believe me, as someone that comes from media as well, we all hate synergy because a lot of times it's forced. But I think in yeah. in, in the case of uh, you guys. Marvel is its own brand, and it's important that there is that consistency between all the ways, the different media platforms that it's on. So, yeah, I hate the word synergy, too, but it does make sense. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in so many cases with us now, it's happening organically. You know, I, I, I know for a fact that, that when, when Thor, Thor is released next week and, uh, and people go to the movies, and in particular our artists go to the movies, and they see the visions of Asgard, and they see, they see how the Asgardians are portrayed, it's not going to be like a mandate that comes down from publishing saying, you know, we really should 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 draw something that's closer to the movie. It's just going to happen because it's so darn cool. As an artist, I look at this and go, oh man, how how, how would I take that idea and adapt it into the into the comics? And I'm not saying taking a literal interpretation of the of of what Asgard looks like in, into our books, but just the spirit of it is is going to change. Uh, it's it's unavoidable, and the same thing will happen in Captain America. We're gonna and, and and look, Captain America took its inspiration not only from the classic Kirby stuff, Kirby Simon stuff, but it also took inspiration from you know Millar and, and Hitch and Bendis and all those guys. Uh, so so you know it's again it's it's one thing that's feeding the next, uh, and it's not happening because it's it's a mandate that's being forced. It's just a matter of people you know picking at things that they consider uh, the best of the best. You know, given what's happening in the Ultimate Spider-Man comic, I'm interested to hear. Well, and, I, and maybe you won't be able to comment on this until the until the program comes out. But given that we're in the midst of the death of Spider-Man and the the uh, cover uh, images that we've seen and the the hints that have already been dropped in the media that there will be a new Spider-Man in Ultimate Spider-Man, I, I, it it makes you wonder what you know, the cartoon will look like and, and, you know, Mm -hmm. and kind of in that's almost in that same way that when Bucky took over for Captain America, uh, some jaded people were like, oh, you know, I'm sure I'll be back to Steve Rogers by the time of the movie. Let me just say as one person that was happy to stay along for the ride and say, uh, you know, let this let this play out as long as it can. Uh, And and, and certainly we are back with Steve in the costume, but it's not necessarily the way that people thought it might end up. So I don't know if uh, if what's happening in the comic book is going to impact. Uh, the cartoon or not, or if you're able to comment on it, I'll just let you. Um, no, no, not, <laughs> not, not, not no, the, 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 what's happening in the comics now will not impact the, the the cartoon as we're developing it right now. Okay, but what what is interesting and what 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 I'm I'm going to be interesting interested to see if it happens is that there are uh, several storytelling devices that we will be using in the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon. I don't want to give any of it away, but but it's stuff that 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 we've put in that we think is. Is unique, uh, you know, hasn't been done with Spider-Man, or actually may not have been done in a cartoon that I'm aware of, uh, but also is still keeping within the spirit of Spider-Man, something that that's very Spider-Man-esque. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to be curious to see if you know when that cartoon hits, uh, and 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 is the, the the huge hit that it's destined to be. Uh, I'm not too confident, am I? Uh, <laughs> Whether, you get good whether people on it, it's some, all right. Right. Whether some aspect of that is actually going to gonna, you know, seep into the comic books a little bit. Uh, I can see it happening. I can see it not happening, but, uh, but it'll be fun to see. Interesting. Well, you know, I think in general, animation has really uh, grown up 
I think, in the last 10 years. Uh, from And really, I would say that about your competitors across the street as well, where, oh, yeah. where you know, you're making it for a PG-13 audience, but you're not you're not playing down to them in any way. And I'll even include, obviously, the next uh, ventures with that as well, the the, the kid uh, group from the future. You right. know, I mean, it's uh, I, I really think that, you know, you, you, you're doing enough to satisfy, I think, the Marvel audience, the, the reading audience, but also presenting a product that is accessible to the new ones. And that's why I was wondering, too, with the cartoon, Again, with the changes, I, I, you know, you'd hate to have it be a success and somebody reach for an Ultimate Spider-Man comic and find, you know, Jimmy Johnson as, uh, as Spider-Man as opposed to Peter mm-hmm. or whatever. So, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll let you play it out and see, see how things go on the publishing <laughs> side. You and know, I'm happy to be on the ride. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that we're we're, we're not fearful of. If if okay. you know, there, there used to be there used to be a a, a, a trope in in the comic industry, uh, which was you know if you got a movie coming out, make sure your character in the in the books is as pristine as he's going to be he or she's going to appear in the movies. Um, and then you know we did something called Civil War right around the time mm-hmm. when 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 there was going to be an Iron Man cartoon, uh, Iron Man movie. I'm sorry, uh, where where you know. Those who use conventional wisdom sort of looked at us and said, wait a minute, is it possible that Tony Stark is being perceived as the villain of this particular story and, and you guys are, are doing this right now, right, right at the height of, of, of an Iron Man movie? And we're like, yeah. Uh, but when you look at it, Tony Stark has never been more popular than he than he started to become during Civil War, and I think it was precisely because we presented this different point of view for the character that that while maybe fandom didn't agree with at first, was a, still a pretty honorable and logical point of view. Uh, and again, as, as Captain America movie hype started to really break, is when Captain America died. I mean, right. most people, you know, most companies would never have attempted that, or Marvel certainly wouldn't have attempted that many, many years ago. But but we've realized that that the that the audience is smart. The audience gets it. Um, and any kind of hype around your character that's bringing your character to the forefront, uh, especially around the time of the movie, is is fine. It, 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 it's good, you know, and uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt uh, the the final product at the end of the day as long as as you're telling good stories, and that that really to me was the hallmark of uh, of of Ed's Winter Soldier story arc, with Winter Soldier becoming you know Captain America, is the fact that at the end of the day, those stories were so good that as we started polling people, I remember polling people at a couple of Joe panels at a convention, saying, "Hey, uh, who wants to see Steve Rogers back?" And we'd get 50 percent of the room, and the other 50 percent of the room wanted Winter Soldier back. That's just a testament <laughs> to how good Ed is and how great a story he told. That he actually made people. Think at ah, the hell with Steve Rogers. <laughs> you know, I like Bucky, um, and th- that's you know that's a win-win in my book. Well, plus breaking one of those ultimate Marvel taboos for decades of you know the only people that stay dead are Gwen Stacy, Uncle Ben, and Bucky, right. and, and now take Bucky off the list. So that's you know that's great. No, I've I've enjoyed Ed's ride. Yeah, also, and, and to be to be honest with you, I never understood the Bucky one, but you know, there no, you go. I, well, I, no, and I love I love the reinvention of Bucky, and and I yeah. and and in fact, it makes me want to see more of it. I'm glad to see. That you're doing things uh, with uh, the World War II era of Cap uh, in mm-hmm. general in Marvel because I, I really feel that now that you've got a much more harder edge, Bucky, it's a much more interesting thing other than just golly gee whiz, Cap. What do we do next? You know, you, right. you got a little fighter out there that's ready to slit a few throats and shoot a few uh, bad guys while he's out oh, there. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. And the other thing too, now with Iron Man, I would say that to your guys' credit, you guys learned that you know the lesson of uh, the X Men movie and when uh, the TV Guide tied in came out. Um, you know, Matt, Matt hit the ground running with a story that really did seem like the next step after yep. after the Iron Man movie. So, you know, yep. obviously by design, and I think that's, you know, it's great. I think you guys get how to kind of do the next chapter in the books. So what I'm, like I said, another thing I'm just interested in, and, and this was something that came out a lot in 2010, the uh, the amount of miniseries that came out of Thor and Cap. And we understand there's a new Cap and Thor movie coming out, but uh, both films. And uh, why... Why make such so much new product versus leaning on some, you know, some of the classic stuff that might still be able to stand on its own? I'm sure that discussion probably made it around the, the hallways. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, the, 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 these are decisions that are that are made by our sales department. You know, ultimately, oh, okay, they, they let us know exactly. They let us know exactly how much product they need, and and how much product they believe that retailers need in order to in order to you know uh, basically sell some books. 
Um, and sometimes we do rely on on the you know the the older published stuff uh, because there's a lot of it out there. And sometimes we need new stuff. So uh, you know th- 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 this is a uh, this is an alchemy that uh, that, that <laughs> I don't partake in. Um, you know, especially now I don't partake in. But uh, but basically, you know, the, the sales guys they they know their stuff. So I don't uh, I don't pretend to uh, to to you know understand exactly how they do their their magic. But they they generally tend to be really right with respect to what the audience wants. Okay. Well, I, I I wonder, obviously, with it being in the last few months uh, a, a softer comic magazine market versus what it was, say, during the time of Civil War. And this is something that's you know been discussed, I think, a lot ad nauseum. I think on some of the comic news websites, but when even the New York Times, you know, makes mention of it a few months ago, I, I it's it's a fair question to discuss. As uh, chief creative officer, are you in the meetings in terms of discussing where the monthly magazine might be going because we always and and believe me i know i've lived through the various price changes and Mm -hmm. and remember in the 70s when you know comics were heading towards 75 cents and a dollar all the gasps in the room and everything but now uh when you are talking about you know close to five dollars for a 32 page comic 22 pages of story Mm -hmm. and stuff you got to wonder if there's there there is a, a real ceiling here in terms of how much product that you know a, a consumer can buy versus you know the right. old days and i don't know yeah, listen, I, it, 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 it's, it's always a concern um you know i think the one thing that's that's, that's been proven out uh, most recently is that uh that that while you know they're you know comics certainly have a have a hefty price tag on them uh lowering the price doesn't necessarily mean an increase in sales or an increase in revenue for for retailers uh, I, I think I think you know some people are learning that the hard way. Uh, but with respect to the the future of comic and comics and, and what that price point will be, you know, if that future happens to be digital, right. uh, there's there's lots of conversations going on about that stuff, and, and and it's going on all the time because that technology is is moving very very quickly. Uh, but ultimately, it's the audience that, that that makes that decision as to as to you know what that's going to be. Um, and you know, if we do our jobs right, then we keep our ears to the ground, then then we should hopefully be ahead of that curve but as you attract a new audience and especially in the digital realm um you know and i and i understand everyone's looking for whatever that magic number is that will be palatable right. um yeah i mean that's again is are there discussions in terms of that you know the the 22 page per chapter uh might have to change in some respect um nothing quite Nothing in that sense. Okay. Not, not, not with respect to, to to length, but but again, I I think everything is on the table. Sure. I, I do think everything's on the table. I mean, we've discussed uh, e- e- even the, the the structure of stories, right? I mean, let's you know, there there, there was a time, right, back back in back in newsstand era before there were really uh, before the trade paperback was really a, mm-hmm. a, a you know anything that even you know was was remotely in anybody's mind, where the the, the structure of storytelling was. Uh, soap opera, and you know the, every every story ended in a cliffhanger. And the philosophy behind that, which was a, a, a viable one, was that you don't want to give the reader the opportunity to drop a book. Sure. So if you if you end the story completely and wrap a bow around it, there is that fear that well, you know, what, they may just try something else out because this story is done. Right. Um, so the the philosophy at the time was, you know, you, you tell a story and you if even if you end the big A story, you start a cliffhanger based on the B story that you've been developing throughout you know the past month or two. Um, that changed once the trade paperback became a viable financial model. Uh, to writing stories in story arcs, because at the end of the day, you know, as we start, as we here at Marvel in particular, as we started looking at our back library of older material and saying, oh, you know, can we compile these stories? We realized that we could compile a story, and and by the time we were end with that, we, we were done with that compilation, the story ended in a cliffhanger. So, so you were asking a, a reader to to pay a significant amount of money for a collection that ended in an unsatisfactory manner. So we started looking at the way we were building stories, and of course we started building them in story arcs, much like like movies or mini TV events, um, so that they had a satisfactory ending, and and then you could compile these in four or five, six issue clumps, and uh, and the reader would get a complete story from beginning to end for the price point they were paying, and at least feel satisfied in that. Uh, now, as we move into more of a digital arena, um, what's the new philosophy? I would argue that 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 there may be a philosophy in which we may need to look at shifting back towards that newsstand model, right? Where we want people to continuously come back to the product 
month in, month out, week in, week out. Um, and, and they have, it's an easy access to the product, very much like the newsstand used to be. So do you change your philosophy? I'm not saying we're going to do it. I'm just saying that, that it's definitely something to think about. Sure. How will we create our stories? How will we be, will we be writing our stories? Will, will a, a collection matter at that point when, when really carrying the, the material around is really not a problem? Um, you know, you can carry a thousand issues of Spider-Man in, an iPad, so right. so you know, and, and and get as much Spider Man as you want. Um, so so you know, th- those discussions have also happened with respect to how do we create our stories, where do, where where will we be going? But it's also too soon to tell. It's way too soon to tell. Understood. What the audience may want, because I, I firmly believe that that we're you know possibly two to three generations away um, from from an audience that that will really have a. Def- a, a definite idea of how they want to read their newspapers, read their magazines, um, and listen to their music. That's interesting because obviously, and you being a music guy, I understand how quickly the music world changed with yeah. you know the Napster world and, and MP3s mm-hmm. and and where we are today where brick and mortar music stores are you know hell you you buy your you buy your co- music at Starbucks as well as your coffee and by the way congratulations yep. on that partnership uh, with yeah. Starbucks and, and digital that's going to be very interesting when are we going to hear it details on that yeah when will we hear details but, uh, on that specifically what was that when will we do you know when we'll hear details when specifically? Will we hear your details I I honestly don't know okay that, that you know that that's uh, again it's a uh, that is a, a, a marketing decision. So it's, uh, you know, we discussed, I actually may have some involvement in that a little bit further on down, but, uh, but too soon to announce. Okay. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I'm not sure when that, when, uh, when the details will, will come across. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, and, and let's face it, the, the, the music industry, I think, also got caught with its proverbial, proverbial pants down, uh, and is suffering for, for not being, Basically, ready for the digital revolution and piracy and things like that, which is which is a consistent problem even for right. us, uh, but not quite the the problem that it is for the music industry. Well, and and that's why I'm surprised you said that it might take two or three generations. Because on, on one hand, I agree with you because and I and I kind of feel the artist side maybe is speaking to this that comic art it, it's it's a lot different to have art in your hands or put it on your wall, and as mm-hmm. it is to have it as a screensaver, say on your on your computer screen. And I wonder if if reading books and and you know reading comics in particular, even as opposed to regular just text or prose, uh, is I, I wonder if that art makes makes the difference. But really, I, I I'm shocked to hear you say that it would take, you know, two to three gener. When you're saying two to three generations, are you talking twenty or thirty years? Is that what you're saying when you say? I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking. No, I mean I, I I'm looking at this is like five five year increments here. Okay, you know, all I, right, I'm, fifteen. Years. You know, I, okay. I don't I don't necessarily. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking. I'm not talking about decades. But all right. But yeah, I mean, and, and by that. I'm, Really, what I'm saying is that that, that 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 amount of time for for a for us to really sort of understand what the readership is going to want. You know, okay. I, I look at my do- I look at my daughter right now. My daughter is 10 years old, and she's still reading hard copy books as well as reading stuff digitally. So she's bouncing back and forth. Now, 10 years from now, that may still be the case that that people may be bouncing back and forth between a hard copy and the the digital product. Or they may not. Right. Um, so, so it's 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 going to take a little bit of time because, you know, again, you know, when, when my daughter started school, you know, they weaned her on books and newspapers and magazines. Um, I, I look, I, I I go no further than than uh, I, I used to be on the, the the consulting committee for an art school. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, so once a year, I was invited to the art school to to take a look at um, their program and what they were doing. And uh, and how they were going about it, uh, and I remember going through this art school and, and noticing that they had a paste up and mechanicals class, and I remember telling to the talking you know as part of the board, I said, guys, this, this is this is a, a complete and utter waste of your students' time. Um, but they insisted, no, 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 you got to do paste up and mechanicals. I'm like, look, this is not we're, even at Marvel, we're already cycling out of this. We have like maybe two or three people here who are still doing some paste up work. The rest of it's being done digitally. And now, in a matter of ten years, it's you know they finally got rid of the paste up mechanical course. Um, but nobody does that stuff anymore. That's right. a skill set that's completely lost. And and quite frankly, you know, sure, could you be sad that that the kids don't know how to use a ruling pen? Yeah, be sad all you want. Nobody needs it. Right. You, you have no, there's no use for it anymore. It's it's gone. It's extinct. It's it's you know, it's uh it's it's like desiring a Gutenberg press. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so so you know, I don't know where we're going to be in ten years, but but. 
the audience will tell us. They will they will absolutely decide what it is that they want and how they want it. And and it might be a hybrid model and it might not and you know, but I certainly don't think that it's going to be a there's going to be a model in the future that's going to be uh solely back to, 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 to hard copy that, that that's all people are going to want. They're not going to want this digital stuff anymore. That's just not going to happen. Okay. And let's and back on the story side uh, and, and dovetailing from something that you mentioned earlier, uh, as far as, uh, you know, playing to not, not necessarily, well, I guess it, maybe it is uh, writing for the trade. It, it, and, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, but I wonder with the big events, these, these interesting status quo uh, changes happen in the Marvel universe and I also I, I sometimes wonder if some if a lot of six part stories don't give us a chance to really have fun in that new status quo before it you know and I and I mean that in a specific uh, book by book sense you know sometimes if you know like you're reading Spider Man well actually I shouldn't use Spider Man as an example because I know for a fact that Dan Slott currently likes to write two part stories three part stories but most people write for you know five or six part stories and I wonder right. if two stories a year is you know, enough to really appreciate. Power Man in the new status quo, and then all of a sudden right. now, you know, here we are in, in the midst of uh, fear itself when, you know, that, you know, I, I really thought, uh, like, for instance, Norman in charge in secret, you know, after secret invasion leading to siege, uh, you know, I, I thought that was kind of an interesting time that even though it was, like, you know, again, it was over a calendar year that, that it was going on, people didn't have that much of a chance to tell more than one or two stories dealing in that new status quo. And I wonder what, you know, if you, if you guys wonder about that as you tweak how to react uh, past an event, you know, if that, you know, well, is constantly changing. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we always think about that stuff when we try to serve story first. But, but ultimately, you know, sometimes it's only 12 months of the year. And, uh, and sometimes things fall behind. Sometimes things fall ahead. Sometimes you have to push a calendar in one way or another. Um, so, so there, there is, you know, there's no perfect formula for it. Uh, I think we do, we do a good job of it, uh, more often than not. But, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we, we have to pay the bills here and we have to rely on the bigger stories. Um, and look, you know, I, I for one advocated here at Marvel, you know, in, in, in a few years ago that we needed to take a break off from big events. We needed to get off the merry-go-round. Right. Um, I mean, fiscally, we understood that we needed to do it. I mean, it, it's what it's what sells. Um, and yes, there were those fans, you know, online who were saying, you know, you got to stop with the crossovers. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. But that wasn't the reason why we did it. The reason we did it was because I felt it was law diminishing returns. We were we were writing one story on the back of another story, and we needed to take a break and let our writers and artists start working on something that didn't necessarily tie into everything else and 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 sort of recharge the creative batteries. Um, and consequently, we did do that with the understanding that we were going to feel, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a nip and a tuck here and there, and, and that's exactly what happened. So, so you know, and, and just going back to fandom, you know, suddenly where were all these fans that, that didn't want the, the, you know, that didn't want crossovers? They weren't buying the books as in the same manner that they were buying the crossovers. So, uh, you know, now we are back in the saddle, so to speak, and uh, and, and putting out, you know, uh, bigger stories because, as I said. The fans tell you what they want. They 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 are ultimately the, the the final arbiter of this stuff. And as much as the internet may say otherwise, what fans want are bigger stories. They want big events. They want the tie-in stuff. Uh, so that's what they want. That's what we're going to produce, and we're going to do it. And, and you know, again, now that our batteries are recharged, we can really do some kick-ass stuff. And I think Fear itself is a is a very very uh, big example of uh, of what we're coming at people with. Like, we're coming at people with now. Understood, and I and let me say too, love what Stuart is doing, love what Matt is doing, and uh, enjoying uh, the tie-ins as I've as I've read them so far. It's Wednesday; I haven't picked up my books yet. Right, but uh, <laughs> but, but now now that's another question in terms of uh, where you know there was a, there was a big cry, and I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of it. Of you know uh, titles like uh, Thor: The Mighty Avenger coming out, great great critical favorite. Everyone enjoyed the art. Everyone enjoyed the story and stuff. Uh, it getting cut cut short, and understandably, sales weren't there. I can appreciate a bottom line concern with new titles, but I also know that sometimes uh, there's a problem with getting the word out on a title and it reaching, uh, I, I think, a, a, an audience saturation of, of being available to the market, where everything kind of hinges, it seems like, on that first issue. And if and if the orders aren't there for that first issue, a lot of really good ideas get cut short. Because, you know, again, the initial interest isn't there. Is there a way to better communicate that? Because I really feel that um, 
a lot of good ideas, Dr. Voodoo, Thor, the Mighty Avenger, you know, maybe doesn't get a chance to, to, to reach an audience and, and, and gestate. I mean, I remember when right. you first took over as editor in chief, you had books that were your own critical favorites. Uh, I, I think to Christopher Priest's Black Panther, for example, that you guys really kind of, you know, are like, Hey, try this book. And I remember you being out there and, and in Wizard and on the news, uh, on the website mm-hmm. saying, buy this book and right. everything. And you guys gave it a serious chance. I'm not saying go even 18 months, but isn't it, you know, it, is it possible that we could go a year and then maybe assess or at least in, into a second arc before you, you pull out the rug or is cost concerns really that, that serious where no, if it's either now or never? Well, I mean, if, if we look at our window, and, and I'm sorry to be to be you know a little little serious here, but please, it's not a great economy out there right now, right? Absolutely, T- times are times are tough, right? When things are better, it's much easier to take a flyer and stuff. It's much easier to take a flyer on stuff like Black Panther because even though Black Panther's sales weren't through the roof, they were consistent. They were consistent, and 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 it was it was it was telling some pretty interesting stories. Um, Again, the, the 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 sales and marketing guys here. You know, I, I'm I'm always astounded because they 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 do have this this matrix full of numbers, where they could almost predict very on a very very accurate basis exactly where books are going to fall and 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 where the where the the actual sales curve is going to dip. Um, so when they make these decisions, they, they they aren't arbitrary. You know, and and as much as that Thor book was was wonderful and, and well received. Um, ultimately, they took a good hard look at it and realized that that it wasn't going to be doing what they thought it would be doing, and in particular, in a year where Thor is being marketed, you know, everywhere. Um, so, so there, there is that, and you know, so as as as, uh, as as tough as it was to cancel that book or any book, certain things have to be done. And yes, it, it gets it gets uh, it gets much tighter during a bad economy. There, there's just there's just no there's just no two ways about it. Um, you know, and, and even though you know Marvel does relatively well, we do have to mind our p's and q's and, and make sure that uh, we are still profitable at the end of the day. Um, but you know, then with respect to to marketing dollars, and this is something that I've spoken about from day one as as, as being editor in chief. I mean, it's, it's one thing for me to go out there publicly and and and, and get on a website and say, hey, you got to be reading this. That doesn't cost Marvel anything, you know. Sure. And and when sure. I was editor in chief and I had the time to do that, I I would go out there and and bang a drum about as many things as I possibly could. Yep. Uh, but with respect to what what Marvel puts its marketing dollars behind, uh, they have to be really judicious, right? And you know, people will say, well, why why do you always promote a, a you know a book like Avengers and you don't promote a, a smaller title? Okay, well, look, if, if you look at it from dollars and cents, if it was your money that you were spending out of your pocket, right? And someone said to you, listen. You have this Wolverine book over here, and then you have this smaller title over here that nobody's really reading. Now, you could spend a thousand of your own dollars to promote this smaller title, and you're going to increase, you're going to increase sales on this smaller title by 20%. Okay? Let's say you're selling 10 of those titles, 10 of those issues, right? Mm-hmm. So you're going to increase sales on that book by two, two copies. So you're now selling 12. Or you could take that thousand dollars you have, and you could put it on Wolverine, which is already Pretty popular character, right? And let's say you're selling 100 Wolverine car- books, right? And you're going to increase sales by 20%. Well, where is your money best spent sure. at the end of the day, right? And that's really how marketing ends up looking at things across the board with with any any business. Um, you know, now now mind you, let's say that's th- there are also different parameters here. Let's say that smaller title, that that small book, is something that you think, you know what, there's a really good idea in there, and we may want to eventually build that property for something in animation or in movies or whatever it may be. Or, on the flip side, that title may not be selling really well in the direct market, but guess what? It's doing really, really well in the bookstores. Sure. Right? Our, our entire Max line is like that in many ways, right? I believe so, that. Absolutely. So, so now you're saying, okay, well, now if we invest the $1,000 here, we're, we're, we're not, it's not, not about the two extra copies we're going to sell. It's about... The other stuff that's 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 behind this this particular product, the other what, what this product means to us on a on a corporate level. So when it comes to marketing dollars, you know, and again, if you look at them as your own money, you'd have to say to yourself, well, well, hell, I, I you know, as much as I love that one particular title, I really got to market Wolverine because you know that's that's what's really keeping the lights on in this place. Understood. No, I yeah. understand that. Now, instead, then maybe on some of these other things, is it possible that we move back to? The miniseries or the limited series, as opposed to starting something with the intent of it being ongoing, because I think um, you might get as much of a disappointment 
of, of people not be, being willing to try something if, you know, they like I said, that first issue comes out, and I'm sorry, the orders aren't there, therefore it's canceled. And it's like, it's canceled. It just came out. What the hell? What happened? Listen, so- that, 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 <laughs> that all makes that all makes great sense. The, 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 thing, the thing that I've found in my 10 years of, of, of working as Marvel Editor-in-Chief is that the, the market is in constant flux. Okay. So, so t- today, right, four-issue miniseries may be the kind of thing that's selling. And a month from now, or uh, that's speak facetious, uh, let, let's, let's say six months from now, suddenly fans don't want four-issue miniseries. They want ongoing series. They want to know that there's a longer story here. Um, and, and four issues... The, the miniseries aren't doing anything, or fans don't even want ongoing series with minor characters. They only want ongoing series of the bigger characters right now, and they don't want miniseries. These things change all the time, and I've been in meetings where I've seen it happen. Where all of a sudden we've we've you know we've planned up the wazoo on a particular style of product involving mm-hmm. a particular number of our characters, and realizing you know what we're going to have to tear up track here because um, that particular desire from fandom to want that particular product is now dying out. They, they're looking for this other thing, and we're seeing success in these other areas. Okay, let's shift. Let's move. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I understand it. From, from, from the outside looking in, you know, I, I, I see fans thinking to themselves, well, I don't understand why they don't do this, and I don't understand why they do, don't do that. Not understanding that, that, that things here are, you know, nothing is done by the seat of our pants. Understood. We, 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 we're not allowed <laughs> to do things by the seat of our pants, uh, with the exception of just, you know, just being as creative as, as humanly possible. Um, there's a lot of smart people here who sit around and go, okay, you know, and it's their job to, you know, to, 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 to see the trends, to see what's happening out there, to talk to retailers, to talk to our distributors, and figure out exactly what it is that our, our fans need um, or are desiring. So, so that, you know, when, when you see that we're, you know, that why are we launching an ongoing? Well, it's because that's what, you know, the, the plan, uh, the plan called for, and that's what, uh, what, what we thought was going to work. Uh, why aren't we doing miniseries? Well, maybe miniseries are just not what fans are wanting right now, because maybe, maybe we're, maybe we're looking at, and I'm not, I'm not speaking out of, you know, out, out of, I'm not speaking factually right now, okay, because I'm not in the marketing meeting, but, you know, maybe these guys are looking at, at, at the sales on miniseries and realizing, you know what, people are not picking up these miniseries, they're picking up the, the mainline books, that's what they want right now, so let's do more of that. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, Changed considerably and constantly ever since I've been here. I, I, I see it happen all the time, and and and, I, and I've learned that uh, that whenever I ask these questions, there there's always a good answer as to you know why we're not doing certain things and why we are doing certain things. Totally understand, and believe me, I'm not trying to armchair quarterback you either. But and yeah. it's, and also as you say, not only does it change, but it becomes cyclical as well because. Being, being a reader of multi-decades, I remember when the miniseries were in vogue, and I remember when they went away, and when they came back yep. in the late 90s, and we're in that lull again, so so who's to say? But uh, yeah, I guess... And, 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 and the problem, the, 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 way you, the way you get into trouble in this, in this business is if you become dogmatic about something, and you say, this is the way it's done, Certainly. this is the way it's been done since Stanley was here, and this is the way we're going to do it. Um, and that's how, you know, that's how Marvel has gotten in trouble in the past. That's how other companies have gotten in trouble in the past, is, is by relying on uh, you know, on nostalgia. Is there room for new characters to break through? Because that, and again, I think, uh, and I've seen you guys experiment with, you know, characters like Aranya, Sp- Spider Girl, and I remember when she first came out, and you brought back Amazing Fantasy to to kind of promote her. And then it seems like maybe the successful way of breaking in a new character is doing it kind of in the old uh, situation comedy way of if you want a spinoff, you know, make make the character a prominent character in one book that is popular yeah. and then finally spin them off into into their own book. But I wonder, I mean, since Runaways and, and you know, correct me uh, if I'm if I'm missing somebody, I'm trying to think of a, a brand new idea in the last five years that is really kind of. You know, taken hold, and it's like no, no, no. Oh, well, I, actually, I do know one shield, obviously, John Hickman, mm-hmm. and look at all the great. And I, but again, there's there's at least a tether to uh, to you know establish Marvel continuity to a degree. Right. You know. Well, I, but I think that that tether is what's important. I, I do think that tether is what's what's important. I mean, you know, when, when you look at characters, uh, first of all, it, when you look at any of the iconic characters at Marvel, with the exception of the stuff. That was that was part of the original universe, the stuff that that that, that Stan and Jack and those guys sort of you know popped out with originally. Um, for these characters to become iconic, there's a huge incubation period. You know, it takes a long time. And as much as we consider Iron Man iconic, right? I mean, you know, Spider Man to general audiences outside of the world of Marvel was an iconic character. Captain mm-hmm. America to a certain extent, Hulk certainly to to a major extent because of the Bill Bixby TV show. But outside of that. 
nobody in the general public knows who the hell Thor is. They don't Understood. know who they didn't know who Iron Man was, right? They don't I'm know any. You. They don't know Shield. They don't know Shield from the you know from 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 anybody. And right. So so you know when we call them you know brand new characters to stick, we we're, we're really talking about publishing at the end of the day. True, but. But for any of these characters to become iconic, it takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. Um, you know, and, and, and it takes a, you know, a certain, I mean, actually, you know what? Here's another one for you, Jessica Jones. I think Jessica Jones is a character who is, who has grown through Marvel and will be growing in the future as well. Well, that's going to be uh, interesting to see when the live action yeah. show happens. And, you know. I think there, there, there's always stuff like that, and it's just a matter of timing. Uh, and look, sometimes you create a character and the timing isn't right, and all of a sudden it explodes. I mean, I mean, Deadpool just had a renaissance, right? I mean, you know, Deadpool, when Joe Kelly was writing Deadpool, that was one of the best books Marvel was putting sure. out in, in a very, very long time. And yet it wasn't a huge seller, right? It was having trouble getting traction. Runaways. I mean, we consider Runaways one of our better properties, and, and yet that's a property that sometimes, depending on the, the team and depending on the time that it comes out, has trouble getting traction. But you know what? There could be a time, you know, uh, next year, five years from now, ten years from now, where Runaways is the biggest property that Marvel has. You just, you just don't know. You just don't know what you have. And it's, it's, it's a matter of timing, right, creative team, um, and, and approach to the story that, that, that does those things. So, um, so you know, uh, yeah. I mean, are are there characters becoming as iconic as quickly as you know Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and Thor and Iron Man uh, within the world of comic books? No, I don't think you've seen that from anybody. <laughs> I don't think we've seen that in decades. Sure. Um, you know, but but there there's still stuff here that uh, that will you know hopefully bubble to the surface as uh, as we move along. Well, and all right now. It, it, and by the way, we're at forty five minutes. Uh, do you want to? I don't want to keep you too long. If you're if you've okay. got other things. I may eventually have to go to the bathroom. I, <laughs> so. All right. Well, then, you know, something I'll, I'll ask one more question and we'll wrap up. D- talking about uh, exposing these characters to a bigger audience and certainly through television and films and stuff. I remember in the 90s, there was a real concern about showing spandex on, on live action properties. Right. And, and obviously, that's something you guys still wrestle with. So when you mention somebody like Jessica Jones or even Runaways, I think it's going to be easier for a regular audience to kind of gravitate to those characters as opposed to finding that right look across the street you see the problems they're having with wonder woman's costume i think even though you've got somebody as good as david kelly who i think is a more than proven commodity in television and i'm willing to right. wait until i see it but yeah what what do you, you know it's i i've liked to i've liked the choices that have been made both in the films uh i guess but with exclusively when it comes to marvel we're only talking about the films i thought daredevil's costume i think was was pretty uh, you know Okay, for for what it was, Cap looks great. I think Thor, you accept it because I don't think anyone has a preconceived notion of a god. But when you come to some of these other characters, you know, yeah, that's going to be the question of how how you guys design a look that works for for live action versus comics. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, in, 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 in fairness to the guys across town, I mean, I mean, you know, we we don't know if Wonder Woman's costume is going to work or not yet, and we don't sure. know. Um, you know, we don't know how much they're actually going to use it. You know, I mean, people are focusing on those pictures that are on the internet and saying, "Oh my God," or or loving it or whatever. But look, ultimately, you can't go by what the what the internet is saying, and you can't Understood. go by what those pictures are are providing. They they may find a way to to, to light it, to direct it, to 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 to, to film it. That's going to make it work on television. You know, I, I I'm with the, the, you. know, I I don't think there's any absolutes here. And 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 look, David Kelly is wonderful, so so I'm sure he's going to find a way to make it work. I think ultimately, it's going to rely on story. Is this going to be a good story that people are going to want to see weekly on television? Um, and, but, you know, yes, with, with Marvel characters, it might be a little bit easier uh, depending on the property. You know, I mean, it, you know, I'm not saying there's a Punisher TV show, but right, but could you see Punisher on TV? Sure. Absolutely. You, you don't even need the skull to do it. You know, right. it's, it's just the concept of the public Punisher. And you're right. With Runaways, it would be the same thing. They don't need costumes. And Jessica Jones, no, you don't need costumes. But, um, you know, it, 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 that is the trick with television. It, it's almost... It's almost harder on television than it is. Actually, I believe it is harder on television to to do the costume stuff uh, and make it as convincing as you can make it in the movies. I mean, television is very, very tough. It, it, it's it's a uh, it's almost much more grounded in reality for for whatever reason. There's something about it that 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 yeah. When I think about costumes, I'm like, man, how, how do you make that work? How would you make that work on a on a on a on a week in week out basis? Well, as as we wrap up, I want to congratulate you. I saw the uh, the teaser uh, covers for. The last chapter of the uh, Death of Spider-Man and Ultimate uh, oh, Spider-Man. It looks fantastic. I'm glad that hopefully that uh, the the changes in your position are affording you a little more time to do art. Is that <laughs> no. It? no, it's not. All right. Well, you're, you're, no, no. 
Not at all. I mean, I, I, I don't know when I'll ever be able to do sequentials again, uh, you know, but uh, covers I'll still be able to do from time to time. But, you know, as I look at my list of uh, four covers that I owe at this point, uh, it's not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and talking, and good luck with... Oh, I uh, pleasure, man. And, and good luck with the, the films that are coming up, and, uh, and, al- and also all the animation and live-action stuff. Honestly, I've, I've yeah. had constant conversations with Bendis and Loeb, very excited about uh, the different directions that Marvel is going in, and uh, really congratulations on a, on a great 10-plus uh, years uh, doing what you've been doing. I mean, it's, uh, the, okay. the, the proof is there in the product, and uh, you've, you've been selecting the right people, and obviously you're, you're part of the decision-making as well, so nicely done. Thanks, sir. And, and so is it going to be another five years before we talk again? I certainly hope not. I certainly <laughs> hope not. <laughs> well, well, thanks for everything, John. Next up, a short conversation I had with Joe. Well, 20 minutes, not too bad. But uh, we were in the uh, one of the secluded hallways of the San Diego Convention Center during Comic-Con. Uh, this was uh, right before the release of Guardians of the Galaxy, just a few days before And uh, Joe had some interesting observations. And, you know, I should always listen to these guys because just like uh, back when Winter Soldier was coming out, Bendis was like, you're going to love this. This is your kind of movie. And when they announced Guardians, we're like, really, Guardians? Is that a good idea? How these aren't even B-list characters. These are C and D-list characters. Who cared about Groot? Who cared about Rocket Raccoon? Who cared about uh, Star-Lord or Gamora, you know, or Drax? Uh, Unbelievable, man. But... uh, we grew to know them and love them because of the amazing success of the movie. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, what the you know pre-release buzz was and uh, and Joe's feelings about it and uh, a few other subjects as well. Joe Casada uh, in the in the hidden corners of San Diego Comic Con on this portion of Word Balloon. We start with Marvel's Chief Creative Officer Joe Casada, just days away from the Guardians of the Galaxy film opening. Uh, the early tracking is all positive. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes. I'm hearing as I was flying back. Uh, 100% from audience, 99% from creators. Uh, they had the premiere in Los Angeles last week. This Tuesday, uh, the New York premiere happens, and I heard from a few creators how excited they were to see it. But uh, with Joe, we talk movies, television, and, of course, the comics, because uh, there are big story changes happening at Marvel in all three mediums. We talk about uh, the next the Netflix television series. We talk about, uh, of course, uh, the movie slate and the Marvel movie panel, Joe's role in that, and uh, some of the big changes that we're hearing about. You know, Sam Wilson becoming Captain America and uh, the female Thor. So it's great to get Joe's impressions and uh, have a nice conversation in uh, one of the dark corners of uh, Comic-Con to start things off on Word Balloon. All right, we're here in uh, one of the one of the tucked away corners of uh, San Diego Comic-Con, and I'm happy to see uh, Joe Casada face-to-face. It's always good to talk to you, sir. It's great to see you, man. How are you? Doing good. So we're on the eve of Guardians coming out. Um, you know, and, and I know you kind of addressed it in there in, in the panel that we just left, the 75th anniversary panel. Guardians is not an obvious choice, and I know that it had a long gestation period, but really, we're talking about a C or D level book, like, and I know it's kind of an essay question, but really, like, why now? And can you talk about some of the steps that led you to believe this is going to work? You know, the, the, the conversation internally at Marvel about Guardians has been going on for, for, for several years now. I mean, it, it, we knew it was a step that we were going to take as, as a company because we, we, we know, again, let, let people who've been reading our books have known for a very, very long time. Uh, that you know we're not just about superheroes. We have characters that, that span you know many different genres, many different universes, the galaxy. Uh, you know we do we have characters that that have magical powers, superpowers, technical powers, whatever that may be. Uh, and we knew the Guardians. There was something special there, and it showed a different side of our universe. And we knew that there were there was going to come a point as we you know started to delve into the cinematic universe where we wanted to show the world that. And you know, and, and and in Hollywood at the same time, that we had a very deep bench with respect to the library, and Guardians was a property that was so multifaceted, had such great characters and such a deep, rich universe that we could play in. Uh, that we felt it was uh, it was it was really a great move for us. So we started really working on Guardians. It was a slow burn at first, and then uh, and it became you know something that we seriously started producing, or, or sorry, seriously started to work on. Uh, you know, 
as, as you start to roll you know, through Avengers and, and other things. Brian, uh, choosing Bendis, mm-hmm. Brian Bendis is uh, the, the writer and stuff on the Marvel movie panel as well. This version, was it was it always his published version? Was it geared towards, all right, if we're doing this, you know, every, was everything kind of synergy-wise pointing to let's not only make a great comic, but obviously let's really develop something? And not in that crass way. Of we're making a comic to make yeah. a movie, you know what I'm saying? No, no. I mean, but, but you know, if, if you look at if you look at what we've been doing, you know, we when when we knew that there was an Avengers movie on the horizon, and it was several years out, uh, we started to put a very very big focus on our Avengers property, uh, and we started to put our top line creators on Avengers. So it was no different with Guardians. We knew that the Guardians was on the horizon, and we started to do the exact same thing. Um, and this is because we we understand how important. Uh, our, our fans who read our books, it's all, it all starts with them. They are, you know, they are the people who go out there, uh, they, they support our, prop, our, our product, they support our movies, they're out there virally talking about the things that they love and, and they don't like about what it is that we do. So it's important for them to, 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 to want uh, and desire the stuff that, 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 that we have out there. And, and if they love Guardians, then we know we're on to something. So uh, we wanted to make sure to put our best foot forward with Guardians and, and, uh, and, and have them behind it wholeheartedly comic-wise uh, to support the movie and to support the upcoming animation, which we announced will be here as well, which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's probably going to be, uh, right now, I'm, I'm so psyched about that animated show. It's going to be, uh, be a blast. That's excellent. And I know, you know, Loeb and the, and the animation guys are, yeah. are kicking ass. With... When you guys approach a movie panel, it's something else that Brian and I have talked about. When you're approaching these filmmakers individually and stuff, is there a, is there a general philosophy for the movie panel to walk in when you work in with a James Gunn or a Kenneth Branagh or some of these others that have made you know good films and everything? I mean, what like you know, how do you explain Marvel? to these guys and get that Marvel flavor. And I know, you know, it's auteur versus committee and, I, and another conversation Brian and I have had. Well, you know, each one of these meetings is different. Sometimes the director's there, sometimes it's not. I mean, that's really more a question for Kevin Feige because okay. Kevin, Kevin is really, you know, he, he is the, the, the keeper of the flame uh, and, and he's the one that, that really, you know, along, along with uh, the other producers that we that we have at Marvel, who who deal directly with the with the directors on a day to day basis, okay, um, and they understand exactly you know what uh, what, the, what you know what Marvel's philosophy is when it comes to making movies, uh, and they understand that the one thing that everyone knows going in, and this this isn't just stem to our movies. This is everything from our animated shows to our TV shows to the way that we make our comics. Everything is a collaborative process. It it, it all is, you know. It, just in the comics alone, we have we have you know a general story meeting. I'd say four times a year where we fly in all our top writers and we all sit there with editors, uh, writers, and you know myself and, and the whole team, and we sit there and we we start to, to sort of you know really sort of hammer out. The, the next year to two years worth of publishing grand ideas. Mm-hmm. So all this stuff is, is done on a collaborative basis. It's, it's writers with writers with editors. Um, and that's really the stuff that starts to shape not just the publishing universe, but really the entire Marvel universe uh, in, a, in, a, in a grand way uh, for years to come. I mean, you know, when you look at the, the Winter Soldier m- movie, I mean, there was no Winter Soldier in the Marvel universe 10 years ago. It Absolutely. didn't exist. And that's Absolutely. stuff that comes out of those meetings. So I, you know, I always look at publishing as, you know, if Marvel was a, you know, wheel with spokes that came out of the hub. You know, the the hub is really publishing. That's where it all starts. That's fantastic, and I know that like makes a lot of fans relieved and stuff. Is um, oh, yeah, I'm looking at my notes here. All right, uh, you know. Uh, so tell me about the Netflix platform and why it made sense. And I know these 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 are kind of foggy questions as well. But like, what well, you know, well, the, the, you know, yeah. Tell me, you know, the we've got four four shows in development. Daredevil's right. going to be first. Hopefully everything leading to Defenders and everything. I think the count is right. Daredevil, Power Man, Jessica Jones, and then Defenders. Uh, yes, Daredevil, Jessica Jones. Uh, not, not exactly sure. Oh, Iron Fist, too. Iron so Fist. that's right, four, and then the fifth is Defenders. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly uh, exciting deal for us. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be dealing with the... It's, it's really kind of like Marvel Knights. Uh, I'm glad you said that, yeah. because that's what it sounded like in the yeah, panel. Please, it's, go it's, on. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, the, it's the darker corner of the Marvel Universe. It does take place within the cinematic universe where, where uh, a show like, uh, like, like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or uh, Peggy Carter deal more with the world of S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and a little bit, mo- little bit more in the world of Avengers and, and those superheroes. Uh, the, the Netflix universe deals with 
the darker corners of the universe. So, you know, while while Tony Stark, you know, Stark Tower is over there in midtown Manhattan, you know, there's this little corner hell's kitchen where there's, there's this new hero called Daredevil who's uh, who's beaten up on some bad guys. On and, a very uh, street level kind of sense. Very street level and it's very real world. Uh, it's very, very gritty. Uh, and it, but it's not bleak. That's okay. that's the important thing. You know, okay. it's, it's it's that it's still the one thing I think that we're known for at Marvel is that even when things are really, really dark, it's never bleak. It's never hopeless. You still want to live in the Marvel Universe. Uh, there's still an element of fun and humor. Uh, some of it's defa- self-defacing. Uh, but, but at the same time, it, it will always be fun. So, but this is a, this is a, a, a darker area. So, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be exploring those corners. Uh, and right now, we're, we're just having an absolute blast. The cast is fantastic. Uh, Charlie Cox is, as, as Matt Murdock is just amazing uh, so we're having a lot of fun and choosing this platform of Netflix and stuff rather than I mean certainly Disney has plenty of media outlets you know yeah why, why did Netflix make sense for this do you know you know it, it just it just it, it seemed like a great way to tell our stories it enables us to do something that we just we just don't think we can do anywhere else so uh you know, and, and, and we also like what Netflix is doing. You know, they're, Absolutely. they're doing some great, great product. Uh, and we think it's a platform that will uh, that will help us shine, help Netflix, Netflix shine. Uh, and I think uh, it's an interesting delivery system, too, that that, uh, that I think will resonate with, uh, with fandom. You've always said that comics are akin to television, mm-hmm. episodically and stuff. I do think that the Netflix platform and the ability to binge watch makes it even more so and certainly gives you a larger tapestry to kind of play out much bigger stories than, you know, certainly even, you know, two-hour movies can and everything. Yeah, and even the writing of the episodes, you know, it, 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 it makes for uh, an interesting writer's room because you can sit there and plot out uh, a season, you know, and, and, and really sort of see it as a, as a, as a very long movie, uh, but, we, but, but it, does, it does make the writing uh, in some ways simpler uh but but yeah and 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 much more interesting that's cool and tell me uh, you know i've talked to you and i've talked to the guys about the retreats and nothing don't worry nothing no no secret recipe stuff i promise you but um how has your role changed now as creative officer versus when you were editor-in-chief uh you know my role is really again i I sort of i'm more global uh so I, i i get to sit there and I really, I have, I, I have a lot of knowledge about everything that's going on sure. everywhere, so I'm able to to partake uh, some of that and say, um, if we're if we're steering too far away from from a concept where where I know that you know there might be something going on in studios or in animation um, where where we might be steering too far away and saying you guys you might not want to do that because you're you're, you're going to be in such a contradictory place from something else that's going on over here or there might be something that's so interesting going on in publishing that I might go back to studios or to animation and say guys you know they're doing this in publishing it's really great you might want to really check this out you know uh, or vice versa and say you know we're doing this in in, in uh, in, uh, in the animated uh, division, and you, you might want to check this out because it's some really cool designs, and this was a lot of back and forth. So, so I act as a conduit in that sense, but also, you know, uh, one of the things that I, that, I, that I do in all areas is that you know I just I pump out ideas. So, uh, you know, so there's a lot of story stuff I get out there. There's a lot of design stuff. You know, people are always asking me. You know, it's, it's a shame you don't draw anymore. And I'm like, you know what? I'm doing a ton of drawing. <laughs> it's just people don't see it. Because, I understand. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a lot of design stuff and just stuff that's not meant for print. So on occasion, I'll do the cover here and there that sees print. But Understood. there's a lot of stuff out there that nobody gets to see. Or that's or cool. Ever see. Well, the guys, the guys do tell me stuff yeah. like that. Um, obviously, big announcements, the all-new Avengers, all these different, you know, versions. You know, female Thor, and Sam Wilson is Captain yeah. America now and stuff. Um Again, right time. Interesting that it's happening. You know, a good year before the next Avengers movie, or close to it, and everything. Um, yeah, I mean, just from a macro standpoint, these kinds of moves. Why now? As a you know, and I guess well, you address that difficulty maybe of introducing a new diverse character. Certainly, Sam Wilson isn't new, but you know, uh, you know why Valkyrie wouldn't work and presenting her as opposed to no, we're going to make Thor a woman now. You know, we're going to have a black Captain America. Talk about that if you would. You know, the, again, the, these these things just come out of those story meetings, and it, it, it comes out of. Um, Either a writer sitting there saying, you know, I got this story that it goes, here's where it goes, or we all sort of, you know, we, we start developing an idea and 
it's like a you know it's like a snowball rolling down a hill and it just starts gathering steam and before you know it you know we've got this idea where you know Sam Wilson's Captain America um, but it has it has nothing to do with the fact that we're a year out from from the Avengers okay uh, you know traditionally there was a time in I remember a time in comics where uh, you know, I, I was working at another publisher, and 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 uh, there was a movie coming out with the hero, and and uh, and somebody was thinking about doing something radical with the hero, and it was a big cease and desist from the studio. Don't you dare do this because you can't keep him pristine. Because right, 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 out. absolutely, man. Um, Status that, quo. That's not the case with us. I mean, you know, we, we killed Captain America just before that movie came out, and it's you know, it, 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 we're just telling our stories. You know, it has that has nothing really. The only thing that really has that we, that, that affects our books with respect to the timing of the movie is when we try to put a, a, a concerted effort by putting our top tier creative team like we did with Avengers and like we did with Guardians that does affect our, our publishing plan because we want to we want to put our best foot forward and have those books out there for people um, but uh, with respect to the stories we tell no, nah, it's got nothing to do with it. You know, okay. we just had this great idea for a female Thor uh, I, I wish I could tell you the ins and outs of that because it's fantastic uh, and I think when people finally hear the full story, it's going to blow their minds. Um, you know, we trust I, Jason Aaron. Yeah, I, I, I can't understand why people are getting upset about it. Nah, hey. uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a great stuff. Enough. Excellent. And as uh, last question to this is like three dimensional chess for you because really you started off as an artist mm -hmm. you you get into publishing uh, event comics and Mar Marvel Knights was it event comics forgive me all right there you go absolutely you and Jimmy do a Marvel Knights you become editor and you know editor in chief and 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 as now your palette gets bigger mm -hmm. television movies animation and stuff as an artist and stuff and now that you are doing these other platforms these other medias and stuff how how is it just from a personal standpoint to play on this wider canvas you know, it, it, it gets exhausting um, but but, it, but it's also you know, it, it's a lot of fun I mean just recently um, I, got, I started getting involved in, in some of the uh, some of our live action stuff like like th there's a uh, a Feld live action stunt show that that uh, that is touring uh, I believe they, oh, wow. I, believe, I believe it officially opens uh, I think it's August 10th in, in Brooklyn uh, at, at the Barclays Center. Cool. Uh, so so I, I was involved in that. So and, and that was kind of fun because I, I got to uh, uh, I got to, to also it was also some great help from the Disney, Disney theatrical folks who have incredible experience in that world. Uh, they were a great help in in in, uh, in sort of helping us uh, learn about the world of, of of those kinds of shows, live action shows. Uh, so getting education in that, you know, so yeah. that, that's like a world I never would have dreamt of ever been, been dealing Absolutely. with, and and. It's it's just it's, it's eye opening and it's, it's kind of cool. So uh, you know, it's great learning those and having those new experiences. So I'm learning a lot of new stuff. Um, you know, being involved in Netflix stuff. Uh, there, there's there's some things that we're doing on the Daredevil show uh, that, that that I'm spearheading. That, that I'm also I can't I'm not allowed to say what it is. Understood. But uh, but you know I'm, I'm just again learning a lot of new things. So that that kind of stuff is cool. Uh, the downside is you know there, there, there's there's a there's a lot of traveling. Uh, you know, to my job, um, you know, while I do draw, I don't get to draw as much as I as I used to. Uh, you know, I, I miss drawing sequentials because I love to tell stories. Sure, man. Uh, you know, covers, we miss you. <laughs> we miss you. Absolutely. Covers are okay. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I I I am really I'm, I'm, I'd love to draw a story or a short story or a book or a run, but you know, then reality comes in and I realize who, 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 who am I kidding? So uh, so someday. But uh, but that part I miss. So that that that's that's the hard part. Is just is is not having the ability to do that. Uh, coming to Comic Con and you know sitting there and realizing I don't have any books out. You know I used to have books well, out. Yeah, man. Sign. I have nothing. <laughs> so uh, so I you know I come around and I you know, wave, wave like the Queen of England and. Uh, <laughs> To a panel, and uh, you know, I'm thankful people just still show up and, and, and remember who the hell I am. So, hey, don't kid yourself, you know, man. So that's kind of cool. We miss the art. We miss the writing too. Man in the Iron Mask. Yeah, uh, good stuff. Absolutely, man. You know, and uh, no, I uh, seriously, congratulations. I'm thank glad you. everything's going as well as it is. Sure. I know you're one of the busiest guys out there, so so thanks for making time for me. Absolutely. And yeah, hopefully down the road, you'll uh, I'll get you in your office or something like that, and then yeah. get you on the phone like we've done in the past and absolutely. stuff. It's a pleasure as always. Thanks, man. Okay, next, uh, in 2015, in August of 2015, just over a year from that last conversation, I caught up with Joe in his office, he was kicking back, and uh, we discussed, uh, man, the success of Guardians, what was ahead, and uh, odd timing, because literally a month later, uh, they announced the end of the Marvel Movie Panel's involvement with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Of course, they still had an influence on what was happening in television and animation, but uh, surprising, shocking, to say the least. 
of uh, what was to come. And uh, who knew? I mean, this is days before the uh, the massive word. And I don't know. You know, did did you already know? Was the writing already on the wall? I have no idea. But uh, it was still an interesting conversation. Joe Casada from August third of twenty fifteen on Word Balloon. All right, without further ado, I want to uh, get uh, Joe Quesada on because uh, it's always great to talk to Joe and find out what's happening in the world of Marvel. Uh, Joe is on his speakerphone. He was relaxed and everything, so there's a, a little bit of that quality to the phone line, but otherwise it, it sounds great. You're going to understand every word he says, and it's an excellent conversation. Happy to uh, sit down and spend a minute with uh, one of the makers of Marvel, Joe Quesada, now on Word Balloon. I am catching the mogul in his office reading a script. Man, how uh, how Cecil B. Demi- Mill of Joe Casada. Uh, yeah, I don't know if mobile's appropriate here, but <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's bigger than Best Boy or Grip, isn't it? At this point, uh, I guess so. Come on, Chief Creative Officer of Marvel. Uh, it's been a year, and I'm happy uh, to talk to you again and get an update on uh, goddamn another great twelve months of uh, Marvel being exploited through the comics and the movies and television and beyond. Congratulations on a, on another big year! Well, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. You know, it, it's always uh, uh, it, it, it's fun to be a part of. You know, it is a uh, it, it's just an incredible team that we have and. Uh, you know, everybody pulling together to, to, to do the stuff we do. And more importantly, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's incredibly rewarding that the fans love it, you know, cause, cause as I always say, it's, it's a very democratic system. Fans vote with their dollars or with their feet. Uh, and they seem to be voting with the dollars, which means they're enjoying what we're doing. And hopefully we can, uh, keep that up and, you know, uh, do the best we can. Excellent. I, I very I do want to talk about movies and television primarily, but I have to acknowledge Secret Wars because um, it's always important to, to mention that you're still very much a part of the comic book world, and you're the first exec I think I've talked to mid-story. I talked to uh, Tom Brevoort before the story and John Hickman, and, right. and then mid-story now. Uh, I got to tell you, it's a great event, and I mean, I'll be honest. I liked Original Sin a lot. Some of the uh, events before Original Sin, I think, had their little clunky moments. But Secret Wars mm-hmm. has just been thrilling. It is legitimately a giant event, and it is universe yeah. changing. But it's it's living up to the hype. At least I think so. Yeah, you know, listen, I, I agree with you, but of course I would, right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the truth of the matter is that you know we, we've been working on this, and, and in particular the publishing team has been working on this for many, many years. I mean, Jonathan Hickman came to us with the idea years ago, um, so it's been it's been bubbling to the surface, and he's had a very clear idea of what it should be and where it was going to go. And uh, once you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that we're, we're we're finally in the thick of it, and that uh, fans are enjoying it and they're seeing where we're going. It's uh, it's it's a wonderful and I think historic event. From Marvel, and uh, you know, I think, I think Axel and uh, Axel Alonso, our editor in chief, and, and Tom Brevoort and the whole crew are, are, are kicking ass. They really are. No question, man. No, it's it's really entertaining, and it, and it gives us an opportunity to really where the side stories matter in their own way, in a, in a way that they haven't mm-hmm. in a lot of times in events, and are their own fun little adventures to follow as well. Planet Hulk, every one of these things. I mean, just to name one off the bat, yeah. but uh, but all of it, man. Yeah. You know, really cool. Yeah, and it's allowing us to play with some toys that, you know, we, we've all had some great affection for, for over the years, you know, some of us from, from our childhood and, and, and some later on, but just uh, sort of, you know, properties that have been sitting there and kind of dormant, and, and we get to rekindle them or reinvent them in, in a number of different ways. So uh, that, that, that also, to me, is really the fun part of this. Excellent. Well, I want to talk about Ant-Man and give you guys your props because, um, you know, it's it's weird. The industry watchers... I, I think are still not quite ready to say that it's an unqualified hit, even though it you know it's mm-hmm. won the two weekends in a row. It's it's weird to right. determine what the uh, what the level of success is for everyone to kind of I think go Phew, okay that was good and we had another one versus ah did it right. underperform or whatever. Honestly, uh, uh, on its own merits as a movie, I thought it was excellent, and it seems like word of mouth is allowing it uh, the audience to find it in a way that maybe the other movies that had that big splash at the beginning like guardians and the ones before it you know normally have this one i think hopefully will continue to grow as the summer continues yeah i do and i, and I think i think it's a really special movie it's, it's a lot it's so much fun you know and it just it just 
it's uh, it's got everything you, you you really want in a summer movie, and then it's something you walk away, you walk out of the movie theater, and and I think fans and 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 and, and non fans walk away and they're smiling. Non fans, of course, going, "Wow, I didn't know there was a guy named Ant Man!" Right? And that's really really cool. Uh, and, and, you know, and again, I think that 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 shows the power of the Marvel brand and and, and the power of our creative teams. Uh, that you know, we, we can take something like Ant Man uh, that the world is not necessarily aware of, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 you know, if we do our job right, you know, he becomes a household name. Tell me about because um, I think one of the interesting things, and it, it kind of happened by accident when Edgar Wright left the project. The different creative voices that are involved in this movie, and I think are all represented well, not knowing whose part was which, and I don't necessarily need to know that. But it just seems like right. there's you see Adam McKay's influence in the script, you see Paul Rudd's influence, you see Edgar Wright in this, and then also mm-hmm. it's all wrapped around what has been a very successful Marvel adventure movie formula yeah and and, and then I, I think you also have you know uh, characters that that, that that come to that come to the forefront like like, like michael Pena's character yes uh which you know all of, all of a sudden you know like wow that, that's <laughs> he, he, he's he's almost a superhero unto himself <laughs> and, and and he 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 really sort of ties it together for us and and, and brings a, an amazing humanity to it uh i just you know th- th- those are the, those are the things that you sort of hope happen and 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 really uh, you know, you, you, you can't expect them, but you hope them to happen. Uh, as, as you know, the chemistry between between you know actors and and and, and director and writers. Uh, so, so we're really thrilled with so much of that. Peyton Reed coming into this movie, um, and really, you know, there there've just been. Uh, things of, you know, movies starting with one director, ending with another. The only comparison I can see, because I really think a lot of what you guys are doing in movies and TV is kind of uncharted waters. The closest thing I can think of are the Bond movies back in the day mm-hmm. when, you know, you had these different directors come in, put their stamps on the movies, but also, again, had to still work within the trappings of what audiences were expecting from a from a James Bond movie experience. And, you know, like you said, Michael Payne is a great example of this great left field character that can come in, mm-hmm. stand out, and be effective and stuff. But as someone that is part of the creative process, and you're on the Marvel movie panel, can you can you quantify what that's been like? You know, now in twelve movies and watching you know these different shifts, and you know, are you able to step back? I mean, is it, it you know is it hard putting all this together, or is it oh my god, you know, we're not only getting influences from one creative mind here. Look at the you know half dozen people that are, have their fingerprints all over. Anne. Man. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think with with anything, I think with any creative process, in particular Marvel, um, it, it's all about collaboration, and, and, and it's all about what what each individual person brings. You know, I, I I could point to the screen and say, oh, that little bit, that was something that I came up with in in the creative committee, or that's something that Brian Dennis suggested, or that's something that Kevin Feige, uh, you know, took and, and sort of turned on its ear and 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 made it work. You know, the, the, there's all those little bits and pieces, but ultimately, when it's you know, when we, I think when we look at it from Marvel, uh, you don't really know where it starts and it begins. It just it just it just sort of clicks. If it clicks, it's going to work, and at the Really, it's all about story. It's all about story and, 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 and getting and keeping true to the character's inherent formula. Uh, and that's really what we strive for. And, and, and then looking at each one of these movies as, as different, within the same superhero genre, as a subgenre, you know. So, so, so Ant Man was basically a heist movie, mm-hmm. you know. So, in that sense, it's different than Winter Soldier, which is sort of you know espionage and, 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 and action espionage and, and cloak and dagger kind of stuff, and, and Avengers, which is straight out superheroes, you know, balls to the wall kind of sure. stuff. So, we we try to look at each one of these properties as as their own sort of subgenre within the genre, and I think that also helps, and, and that's also what where it differentiates from James Bond, where James Bond is, is very much. James Bond, right? And so when a director comes in, they, they have a a reasonable template of what's to, to be expected out of the James Bond movie, and then trying to make it great within there. Uh, at Marvel, yes, there's a template and a formula to a Marvel character, but then, you know, what can you do with it and, and turn it on here and, 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 and look at the genre within the genre? Are you able to then also, when the fin- f- finished movie comes out, you know, and, it's, and really Guardians, I think, and Ant Man in particular, in the last year, there there just seems to be even more opportunity for comedy. And does it then influence 
what's coming in phase three and phase four and say, well, shit, look what we were able to do with these things. Let's try and, you know, as organically as possible. But, hey, you know, there, here are avenues that, again, maybe didn't occur to you guys until the creative process started. Are you able to look back and go, oh, we want more of that? That was, like you said, Michael Pena, perfect example. Not that you're, like, desperately searching for another Michael Pena, but, you know, like opportunities for a different kind of filmmaking. I, I think some of that stuff you can plan for. Some of the stuff has to happen organically, but we also, you know, we we, we understand with our with our movies that there are certain elements that we think are important to us, uh, even in our most serious movies, our, our most dramatic movies. Uh, I also think that, the, that that we have to have a a a sense of humor as well, you know. Mm-hmm. I, and, and I think we, we th- those moments are important to us at Marvel and have always been important to us at Marvel, you know. And, sure. and it starts with. You know, Stanley's self-deprecating humor in his in his, in his soap soapbox. I mean, yeah. all that stuff has been a part of our DNA. And and, and but at the same time, we could also look at properties uh, like Daredevil uh, on Netflix, and we could say, you know what, we're we're going to go darker with this than we ever have. So so you know, we, we break away from the formula a little bit. But even Daredevil has its moments of levity, right? Because absolutely Bobby comes in and and says something that just breaks that tension. And I I think that's important. I I, I think you have to balance it out. I mean, th- th- we, we certainly never want to get, at least at this stage in the game, we don't want to do anything that is so dour and glum. Uh, we want people to walk out of our movies or, 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 or when they turn off their television, we want them to feel like not only did they have a, would they experience a great adventure and a great story, but they also want to live in the Marvel Universe. They want, you know, they, 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 they want to be here and, and, exp- and, and be a part of it and, and, and so, you know, I, 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 I could live in a New York where the Avengers, you know, are defending us from alien threats. Even though there's alien threats, it's still a pretty cool world, you know. So uh, we don't want to be so dark and, and, and heavy where people go, wow, that was intense and I'm so thankful I'm, you know, that's not my world, you know. Uh, we, we always want to keep that sense of, it, it's, you know, this is Marvel, this, this is your universe, and this is, this is your world with just a slight tweak. Understood, and and it's funny. I just spoke to uh, Loeb on uh, Sunday, and you know, heavy, uh, he, yeah, heavy television talk because, and I wanted your point of view as well as we mentioned the Daredevil series and Netflix. Mm-hmm. This is, I mean, and uh, uh, critics have said this, and all the geeks were all saying this as well, and I'm sure you guys in the, inside the House of Ideas are saying it. This was a game changer. I mean, it really, really was. It was a big gamble, and I think it was to uh, great success. Um, I love the ABC shows as well, but as you say, mm-hmm. the the darkness worked. It did have mo- its moments of levity as well, but it was, in the best uh, sense of the term, adult storytelling going on. And you did it with Daredevil and a guy running around in a superhero costume, and yet... It felt like what you guys were going for, that 70s New York crime movie vibe. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously that's a testament to the performers and the crew and the writers and the, and the directors and everyone involved. But, I mean, this, this is thrilling, and it's, uh, it's, like I said, uncharted waters, it seems, for, you know, because there have been other television and uh, superhero shows and movies about superheroes, but just not only the, the medium of streaming video, but the, the type of programming that you guys put together for Daredevil, and I'm assuming, you know, more to follow with uh, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and, and the like for the, for the Netflix stuff. But, yeah, tell me. Now that, you know, the, the season of Daredevil is over and as you're getting ready to premiere Jessica Jones and go into production with Luke Cage, like, is, is there a sense of, wow, we did that? Well, hell, if we could do that with Daredevil, did it open up the creative juices even more for these next Netflix projects in particular? Well, you know, the, the, the plan has always been the plan. And, and, and again, this is a testimonial to, to Jeff and, and, and his team and, and, and the work that they've done on, on, uh, on our television shows. Um, but, but I, I think really in this case, it was a matter of the character dictated what was best. You know, when, when we got Daredevil back, uh, from Fox, we could have very easily have said, you know, we'll make Daredevil into a major motion picture. But looking at it and, and looking at, uh, what might be best for the character and the storytelling of the character, we thought, you know, this, this feels more like episodic TV. It feels, it feels like a superhero procedural because of the of the legal aspects of, of you know Matt Murdock, uh, and also the fact that when Daredevil is at its best, when when you look at the history of Daredevil comics, when it's truly at its best, it's when it's down and gritty and real world, 
uh, and and you know it, 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 it's not quite the world of the Avengers. It, it's very as I as I often tell people, the Avengers are about saving the world. Daredevil's about saving the neighborhood. Yep. Uh, the stakes can still feel the same, even though they may be smaller. Uh, be, because of, you know, whatever is important to the people in that neighborhood and, and, and what's threatening them. Uh, so in the case of Daredevil, I think it, it dictated where we needed to go if we wanted to do it right. And then, uh, you know, we had Drew Goddard come on and then, and then Steve DeKnight as well, yeah. uh, who just had this wonderful vision for the show. And again, the vision of the show was, uh, this is again what happens when we, when we're looking at making your movies is, you know, the, the character is iconic. It's been around for long, much longer than any of us, really. Yeah. Most of us working on these shows. And, and it's not broken. The formula is right there. So let's take that formula and adapt it to the medium and then, and, 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 and then tweak it for the modern audience. And, and, and that, that just sort of dictated where we went. And, and then Drew's, I mean, I've told the story before, but I'll tell it to you. You know, Drew's uh, script for the pilot was so real world and, and and you could feel New York and you understood these characters and uh and then there was a moment in the script where and you know the scene if you've seen the show it's a spoiler warning if you haven't it's in the first episode uh, you know Foggy and Matter being walked through a possible office space mm-hmm. by a by a realtor. And they're they're haggling about price and she said, Well you know prices are as low as they've been so you should go you should buy now because you know ever since the incident, yes. right? Meaning when the Avengers said, in the original script, if she said, you know, ever since aliens popped through a portal and, and, and everyone, once we, all of us, once we read that moment, we all bumped on it because Drew's script was so grounded in the real world that this mentioning, uh, you know, just blurting out of like aliens popping through a, an interdimensional portal just all of a sudden shocked the system and like, wait, wait, what am I watching? Right. right. So, so we had to, we had to look at a way of wording it that it felt right within the world. And then, and then slowly but surely starting to ease in the rest of the Marvel universe. So you'd hear people talk about, you know, you'd hear, uh, uh, Wesley talk about, you know, a guy in, a, in an armored suit, a guy with a hammer. But all those moments were very carefully selected at, to, to build one upon the other to sort of ease the audience into Oh shit! You know, the, 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 the Avengers live here. That's right. We forgot right. about that. You know, so uh, but again, it's it, 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 we we had a plan, uh, and we we knew that this was something different that we haven't done. And all you can hope for is, you know, what we got great storytellers, we got great actors, great great directors, a great crew, uh, just a great production team all around. All you can hope for is that the fans enjoy it. Jeff described uh, Daredevil as kind of an homage to French Connection and, and you know, uh, yeah. Taxi Driver and things like that. And I asked him because Jessica Jones and Alias, the original comic book, kind of occupied that same world as Daredevil's Hell's Kitchen, but in a slightly different way. His movie analogy, without spoiling, he said, think Chinatown. And I thought that was interesting yeah. I don't know if a different movie without spoiling comes to mind. And I know that, again, different opportunities for different kind of humor with Jessica Jones in Brian and Mike Gatos's book that I'm sure will be exploited yeah. in the series when you've got somebody like Kristen Ritter that can do comedy as well. But again, it's, it is action adventure and it's probably her showing her dramatic chops and then more of the breaking bad stuff than, than what we got in, you know, the, the bitch in floor two or whatever the hell that ABC sitcom was that she was on. But you know, can you, and I'm sorry if there are kids in the room, you said your family was there. I apologize. But you know, yeah. Can you quantify like a, a tone? For, for Jessica Jones without, without revealing too much? That, this was a tough one because, because you know, I, I think Jeff, Jeff named probably the only movie that we can compare it to right now. With, I mean, I, we could compare it to a few other movies, but I think he would give away uh, a okay. little too much of what, what makes Jessica Jones different than Daredevil. And the, the, only, the only thing I could say to that is in the same way that uh, you could look at Captain America Winter Soldier as sort of a Tom Clancy espionage, absolutely at the superhero genre, and then you can take Ant Man and look at it as a heist movie within the superhero genre. Daredevil was very much French Connection and and Taxi Driver and all those shows and all those movies, and and Jessica Jones is again taking that sort of dark noirish Chinatown uh, concept, 
but there is another element to it that I, I, I just if I say it, then it sort of tips off the okay. difference between the two shows. Right. So I just I just want fans to, to, to watch it and go, wait a minute, oh my god, look at what's happening here. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, it's another take on the on the genre which i think is fun that's great man you know that was the beauty of the max line when it came out Mm -hmm. you know back in the day and it leads me to another question that's coming up both in the movies and in uh agents of shield and it started this season with the inhumans your own nyx was an opportunity to take the mutants to a more grounded real place and um obviously you know, there's, there's. Thank you for remembering that book, by the way. It was an awesome book, man. Absolutely, and I know it was only about nine yeah. issues or whatever, and we were bummed. But you got busy, and Josh got busy, and everything, so it got tough to do it. We all understood that. Sure. But in, in the long run, I I am interested because I everyone knows Fox has the X Men in movies, and and that obviously maybe presented an, a problem or not to you guys. But I think the Inhumans. The way that the human, the Inhumans are now being portrayed gives you an opportunity yeah. to tell a similar set of adventure stories, taking nothing away from the uniqueness of mutant versus inhuman, but also that it allows you the opportunity to tell modern stories in the same way that Brian is doing in Powers, both the comic and the TV show, and really show yeah. the difference between humans and non-humans in this world. And so that's got to be exciting, and I think was an elegant solution to, well, shit, we don't have the mutants anymore. Here are the Inhumans. Well, wait, we can use the Inhumans in this same way. Was that always the plan, or was it born out of the necessity of, well, the X-Men aren't coming back to our cinematic or TV worlds anytime soon? Well, you know, I, without really dealing too much, the, the one thing I can say is that, you know, we, we've had a list at Marvel. We have a list, an ongoing list at Marvel of properties that we feel are uh, are rich with story potential uh, and, and, and potential in other mediums outside of comic books. And we intend to get to each one of them in their time. The Inhumans was right on that list, very much the same way the Guardians of the Galaxy were, was on that list, you know. Uh, I remember meeting, you know, we were meeting about, uh, you know, what, what do we feel are, are potential hot properties and guardians immediately bubbled and we said, this, this has got something. And I don't want to give you, you know, the other names on that list, but the humans was certainly on it. Okay. As are other things that you will see as, 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 you know, again, everything in its own time. We have to, we, one thing has to build upon the next. Sure. Uh, but the humans was definitely something that we, we felt was, uh, it was ripe with potential, and look, I mean, it, it couldn't make me happier because you know so much of this stuff is reminiscent to me of of, uh, of when me and Jimmy uh, launched Marvel Knights. I mean, Absolutely, was, was was one of those things. We looked at it and we go, we said, wow, th- there is so much great stuff here. Uh, all it needs is a little love and care, and uh, and and see where it, where it goes. Well, that's the thing, Joe. Honestly, and I've said this to you before in recent uh, interviews that we've done. I, I just think you've got such a unique vantage point because, like you said, when you and Jimmy Palmiotti started Marvel Knights at a very low point in Marvel's history and you were able to take a group of characters and, and, and teams and say, no, there's good stuff here. We just need to get them in the right hands and the right creative hands, and this stuff can be fantastic again. And out of literally the ashes that a lot of these you know characters had kind of devolved to, you guys put new spins on them or got the right creators to put spins on them from Kevin Smith and Paul Jenkins to, to Jay Lee. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, yourself, obviously, and then you're both writing and, and drawing contributions to, to Daredevil and the like. I mean, you know, that's, that's fantastic. And I, and I really, you know, God, uh, Chris Priest's uh, Black Panther. And I, you know, I'm going to be talking to yeah. Reggie. I'm going to talk to Reggie Hudlin in a couple of days and I'm, I'm looking forward to. Oh, cool. oh yeah, man. No, I, I mean, that's the thing. I really think that all this started back then with Marvel Knights and, uh, it's great great and it must be great can you talk about playing this stuff out now on a on a bigger stage i mean it's one thing to put them out in monthly comic books but you know christ i mean you know several television shows a couple movies a year i mean good god and you know face you know marvel phase four shit we're talking about you know movies that are going to be in our you know when you and i are collecting our social security checks and stuff i mean this is right. this is insane <laughs> that you know this kind of momentum is being built and i and, and seriously i i know and you're the first one to say that it takes a big team to make all this happen but it's got to be great being ringside and also being one of the guys that was able to like flip the lever and go no we're going this way and this is going to work so again you know I, I, no decisions here are are, are made uh, single-handed. You know, it, it is, you know, we, we, we sit and discuss, 
you know, this, this list I talked to, talked to you about, you know, about mm-hmm. characters and properties that we, that we, we feel we'd like to get to, you know, it's not one man making, or one woman making this decision of, sure. this is the way it's going to go. Um, it, it is a group of us, and, and, you know, we, and some, and by the way, we, we, we shift gears several times, you know, depending on what, what the audience, uh, is gravitating to, you know, that, because pace change and, and the best laid plans, right? Right. Uh, so, so, you know, it, 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 there's, there's always a, the wonderful thing about Marvel, this Marvel, modern incarnation of Marvel is that there's, there's a, a real strategy in place. And people talk about, it's, because again, it's not just what properties are great to develop, but are they better to be developed as a major motion picture? Are they better to be developed as television? Uh, you know, where in the world of television should it live if it is television? All those discussions happen and, and, and we, we, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to cross your fingers and hope that you've made the right decision. And, and we've been very lucky, but at the same time, we don't take for granted the fact that, that you know, we're always going to have this incredible amount of success. It, it would be great if we do. Uh, we're always going to be striving for it, but, but I don't think you could ever take it for granted. I know that, uh, you know, during my, my days when I, when I ran the publishing division, uh, you know, I don't know if I lived like a child of the Depression or not, but I always anticipated that, you know what, it, it, this, this, this may not last. Things could happen. The economy could crumble and nobody could want comics or, you know, we could fumble the ball somewhere down the road. So we just got to stay on our toes and stay vigilant. And I mean, that's all we can really do is just continue to try to put out the best stories we can and uh, with the best strategy behind it as well. So uh, we have a great library of characters. There's, you know, I always say that being a creator at Marvel, it's like being uh, it's like being a creative trust fund baby, because you have been <laughs> you have been uh, you you really you, you you look you it's like looking in the bank and all of a sudden wow I got all this money <laughs> you know and and you know we we look at our library it's like oh my god look at all the stuff we have and not only that but just stuff that's been sitting around that people forgot about uh, you know people forget that really the, the the very first successful Marvel movie was Blade right that's right uh, you know that's we didn't exactly we right. didn't. Pre- we didn't produce it, but, but, but here was a character that, that, you know, wouldn't sell a lick as a comic book. It just, it just never caught on. It didn't mean that the character, that was there anything wrong with the character. It just meant that, you know, maybe it was a better property for, for, for major motion picture. And, you know, it, it was, it's, it's still a great movie. You know, it still holds up beautifully. And I think defined the whole vampire genre. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. No, I agree with you. And I and to be honest, I kind of hope that, you know, the powers that be and, and Snipes can get together and we do see a Blade 4 because I, I think there's a, I think there's a story to be told. And I think he's age appropriate. It would be interesting to see old man Blade, you know, as much as yeah, old man Logan is out there. Well, yeah, well, well, I can't speak. Well, I can't speak about any of that stuff. You know, uh, you know what what projects we have in development and things like that. I, you know, I, what I can see is that you know it, it is one of my all time favorite characters. I love the Blade character, and I, I think it's such a wonderful premise. Uh, you know, so but who knows? Well, you know, and I wonder, and and uh, I'll be interested in your comment on this because I had asked Loeb and Brevoort this before because and and everyone is talking about this already, but. I was doing this a couple months ago. I'm not claiming any any genius here, but I connected the dots in the same way that anyone who watches franchise movies or television would, and we saw a 60-plus-year-old William Shatner still as Captain Kirk. We're reaching those age possibilities with... Downey Jr. and, uh, you know, all, 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 your first wave of Marvel heroes. And, you know, right. I, I, and I wonder, it's interesting that at first it didn't occur to me, but with the changes in the comics and Sam Wilson as Captain America or a female Thor, if you guys are almost inventing good creative solutions to what might become a problem as you enter phase four or whenever, you know, post Avengers Infinity War happens of, you know, is the public going to still want and demand to see Tony Stark as Robert Downey Jr.? Because he really, you know, Downey has obviously, you know, put his persona onto Tony Stark and made it with an awareness that obviously was never achieved before. And it's a good problem to have. That's how Loeb said it. He goes, hey, that's a nice billion dollar problem to have. And good good on us that, you know, <laughs> that's the kind of thing that we're going to still be around in 10 years to have that discussion. Right. But but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you are these are these female Thors and and uh, people of color and other people assuming the mantle? These are the possibilities that are out there that you're exploring now in the comics it's interesting to wonder what you guys might be doing TV and movie wise when those kinds of decisions need to be addressed. Well, look, I mean, the, the only thing I could speak to with respect to that is that 
we're, our comic division is trying to tell the best stories possible. And that's all we've ever tried to do. So, you know, when, when we created the, the, the ultimate universe, um, it wasn't with the idea that, you know, we're, we're going to streamline stuff so that, uh, when we get around to making movies, you know, we'll, we'll have all these stories to, to, to or these new incarnations of the characters that might help with a, 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 a more streamlined version in, in, for motion pictures. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the goal and, and, and can never be the goal. Um, the, 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 the one sort of rule, uh, of operation in, in publishing is just write great stories, draw great stories. Uh, it is, it is essentially the R&D division of Marvel. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything starts there. Every, everything that we do outside of comics, whether it's animation, television, video games, movies, all that stuff, uh, all those, all those different mediums, uh, are there to really cherry pick what's been going on in publishing. It has to start in publishing. It's so important to us. It's our lifeblood. Uh, so, so, so publishing, and again, because, you know, publishing has, when you, when you write and draw an epic story, like, like Secret Wars, uh, you have an unlimited budget, <laughs> so to speak, special effects budget. You can sure. do anything you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so, so comics are, you know, are, are, are as much in our untapped imagination as possible. That's what we want. And then from there, uh, who knows what bubbles to the surface, right? Who knows? What becomes the next big thing, and 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 sometimes those next big things become things that you start seeing uh, in in other aspects of the Marvel universe, whether it's our our you know movie and television universe or our animation you know universe. Uh, that's the goal. That's really the goal is to is to, is to keep those ideas uh, alive and 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 vibrant. Okay. So so the fact that we that we have all these different char- incarnations of the characters. And, and we have a female Thor, and we see Sam as Cap. That stuff is fantastic because, first of all, it's a great story to follow, and it's a great story uh, to see where it goes and see where these characters end up. A perfect example of this is Winter Soldier, when Bucky came back, and and uh, and Ed Brubaker uh, created the Winter Soldier around Bucky's persona. The fact that Ed was able to do that, obviously you know, influenced the motion picture and, and gave us a, a, an incredible character to work with. You bet. So, so uh, you know, our hope is that publishing continues uh, to be as creative and wonderfully inventive uh, as, it, as it's ever been. Excellent. You know, you've, uh, you, as you said at the beginning of our conversation, you were reading a script. Uh, and, some t- and last year, uh, you were reminding me that you were working on, I think, maybe the Marvel experience or a live-action stage show that was happening at amusement parks yeah. and stuff. Um, uh, what, if I could ask real fast, because I was looking forward to the Marvel experience coming to Chicago, and all of a sudden, you know, it got canceled. Is it being retooled? or? Oh, that, 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 no, I, it, that, that's a different show. I, I, was, I was working on the Feld show. Okay. Oh the, yes, and the, the that and, and that was uh, co- that, still around. okay. The Feld show's running, but but also, it, well, I, are you able to comment on what happened to the Marvel Experience? Uh, no, I, I actually I can't. Okay. I mean, they, they're they're, they're a, uh, they, they they have a license to do the show, so I, I really don't know the ins and outs of that. Stuff. Okay, you know, those are those are business decisions, and uh, I try to stay away from those as far as possible. You know, I, I come in when. Uh, <laughs> Well, they need to talk about the uh, script and, and character approvals and oh, things sure. like that. So, uh, you know, and it's the same thing with, with the Feld show. You know, I sat there and worked with their director, and uh, and then they go out and they make that show, and they promote their shows, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, hopefully the audience has come. Okay, that's cool. Well, and I guess that's still coming to Chicago, I think, in the fall or whatever. And that's more of a, that's more of a kid's show, correct? It's a, it's an amazingly fun kid's show. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You know, it, it's stunts, explosions. Uh, uh, flying motorcycles, you know, stuff like that. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's all right. I just don't yeah. want to, you know. I mean, I, that's that's age appropriate for little kids. That's hard. That's good. That's fun. Listen, I, 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 I'm, I'm often, I'm often uh, pleased when I get emails from dads and say, you know what? I took my ten year old boy to this show, and you know, forget it. I liked it more than he did. <laughs> I was thrilled. I'm like, that's great. You That's know? Well, that reminds us me when we were kids and they had the water shows, the water skiing shows on the East Coast of uh, yeah. of, of the distinguished competition, of course, across the street and everything. Right. So I, I can and, it, well, and Marvel had its big Broadway shows and things like that. That's cool. Well, Joe, you've been very yeah. kind with your time and I know you got your family waiting. So I'll, I'll wrap up and say thanks. Thanks again for checking in. Way to go. And, oh, and, oh. and, and seriously, yeah, you you and the whole team. 
Uh, no, seriously, very successful year. Really excited about what's coming down the pike in the fall and in 2016, both uh, small screen, big screen, and, of course, in the comics. And uh, hopefully in a few months we can uh, check back and uh, have a new talk. Let's talk, absolutely. Anytime, man. And then, boom, the announcement came. Kevin Feige uh, splits off from uh, the influence of Ike Perlmutter and is able to call his own shots with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And an unfortunate byproduct of that was the uh, dissolvement of the Marvel movie panel with uh, Bendis and Quesada and Dan Buckley and Alan Light uh, roping in various creators when needed to uh, provide extra perspective on various, uh, you know, creations and stuff and uh, heroes and villains. But uh, it was weird. And uh, thankfully I got uh, Bendis to uh, sit down and talk about it for about uh, 30 or 5 minutes or so. And uh, he took all my questions. Some of them he couldn't answer because of non-disclosure agreements. Uh, he was very careful with uh, what he did say. But he was able to still give us some perspective regardless. And uh, also assure us that even though things were ending in 2015, there was still uh, a bit of um, the Marvel movie panel's influence on movies to come. Ant-Man and uh, Doctor Strange among them. So it was very, actually I guess this was right after Ant-Man. Um, and in fact, I, as uh, you know, you'll forgive me. I'm, I'm kind of uh, recording these intros without really going over the conversation. Shame on me, I know. But this was after the release of Ant Man. But I guess, uh, yeah, they, he was saying that Doctor Strange, Bendis was saying that that was the last film that would really have the influence of the movie panel on the screenplay. So uh, let's have this uh, portion of the conversation. Brian Michael Bendis from September 5th of 2015, again, just over a month after that nice, breezy conversation with Joe Casada. Who knew what was coming? But uh, we found out. And, uh, you know, again, four years later, we're, you're, the wrap-up of Endgame, uh, everything that's coming up in the new phase of Marvel films, everything's fine. And the comic books are fine, still great. Uh, looking forward to the influence of Kevin Feige in the comic book world. But uh, let's go back and uh, get more perspective with this conversation of uh, me and Brian Michael Bendis on Word Balloon. I know you're dying to talk about it, and, and yes. there's gonna, <laughs> it'll get a little weird here because... Of all the people involved in whatever this story is, and what we're getting now is a lot of um, un- unsubstantiated uh, uh, quotes and things like that. Um, should I should I title it at least for what we know from the stand? Sure, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No. Okay, I mean the word is that um, now Kevin Feige and you, you might be able to clarify this more uh, reports directly to Disney, no longer to Ike Perlmutter, and as a byproduct of that the Marvel creative movie panel has uh, disbanded. And at least that is the report that I am hearing. Yes. And of all the people involved in this um, story, I am the only one that I know of who has a non-disclosure agreement, yet a very public profile. So if, if you want to talk to me about it, I'm easier... To uh, oh oh oh! <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm the sorry, our time is up. That would be Brian's lawyer indicating that he is reaching a red <laughs> red point. So let's move on now to uh, <laughs> film for the fourth. Um, no, I I, I I have people texting me all day, but uh, um, <laughs> but um, that's that's, that's, Cal Fegley. that's Cal Fegley from CBR right now. What yeah. the hell's going on? Talk um, to me. No, I, I will tell you um, that. I I I I've been, I'm not allowed to talk about anything good or bad. Like there's good things, and I I can't talk about those. Like I'm not allowed to talk about anything legally. So it's weird that I'm the most accessible person in a story, and I'm not allowed to say a damn thing. You know what I mean? So I I apologize for that. Now, um, that said. What I found very interesting, I know you like this shit too, is okay, so, so there's a story, and it was run on a lot of different websites multiple times. Like some of it was multiple headlines. So it's certainly by, by no means the most important story of all time or ever, but it was worth more than one article by many, many things. I am named in almost all of them that I can tell. Guess how many media requests I received on this subject in the last two days. 
A hundred. One. One. One person, and I'll even say who it was, at, yeah, Tom, at, at Albert Chase. Yeah, we're going to talk tonight anyway, so go on. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about you because you knew what we were yeah. talking about. Albert yeah. King at Comic Book Resources is the only person <laughs> in all of entertainment media who reached out to me to ask for my comment. So everything you've read is people cutting and pasting other people's things that they had. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And I, 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 I truly don't care. I don't want be, to be part of any of this, you know. But I just, as a as a journalism nerd, as you are, as I am, mm-hmm. it is fascinating how far things have fallen. That a story that was worth reporting on more than once, no one did their own work at all. No one reached out to anybody to ask for a comment or opinion. And you know this because you've talked to Buckley and Casada, the other. Two I'm just talking there. about. I'm just talking about me. All right. Okay. And here I am, I'm on... I'm, that Albert's the person that's contacted you, and despite all these other news sites reporting on the story. Nobody did any homework. They just cut and pasted someone else's stuff. Right. Fascinating. That's how far. Yep. And then, I'll, okay, and this is stupid. This is a dumb thing that really nobody even knew the creative committee existed except for, I think, me talking about it. I don't think anyone else has ever talked about it. True. I, I don't. I can't remember. Well, uh, Joe. When I have Joe on, I Joe always talk to about Joe it? about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I ask him to, um, and I'm always interested in whatever contributions the committee made to the films. So yeah, as each film has come out since I've been talking to you guys, yeah, I've I've asked Joe questions. Dan won't talk just because Jan, Dan is more worried about NDAs than anyone I know, including you. Yeah, you know what? And I got to tell you, and and this is I, I know Dan very well. You would love to have Dan on your show. He he, he truly would be a fascinating guest, and I'm not rubbing it in. But one of the things I love about him is that he wouldn't go do an interview that we couldn't do. You know what I mean? Like, he wouldn't even do that. He'd just be cool. Well, no, I understand. Yeah. So anyway, I just was I was thinking today how, 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 you know, silly this story is in relation to the problems of the world and how little effort was put into the reporting of it and good Lord, what's going on with real stories. You well, know, it, yeah. Yeah. It just, it's just a reminder of like, holy shit. And then it's also just, you know, people believing whatever they read. It, it, it's very funny. Well, so, I also know that the amount of, you know, comic journalists uh, out there that are actually, you know, getting paid to do what they do and have the time, and I'm not giving them excuses, Yes. but um, this is, I'm sure that's why you get this kind of five-year-olds attacking a soccer ball kind of mentality of, oh, that's the story, all right, ah, and we're all just going to, like you said, cut the paste. Yeah, and I I, I don't want to, oh, poor Brian, I'm not doing that. It just was fascinating to me. Um... Uh, the realities of how it affects me are, as I, I, I just posted on Tumblr, um, are are very. There's no change in my life. Like uh, like there were some reports that I've been completely fired from Marvel. That is obviously not true at, at all on right. any level. Um, I, I'm under contract. I just resigned last year, so I'm under contract for quite a while. And uh, you know, I, it just so happened to be that today I. I talked to Axel and uh, Joe and Tom and uh, emailed back and forth with Dan about this cool shit that we got coming uh, that we're all very excited about. So, like, my day actually isn't different, if that makes sense. So the rest of it, if, 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 if I, I don't see any official statement from anybody that's been made, so I, that that's why there's, like, Nothing I can comment on. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I know it does. That I, I know. I know this sounds frustrating, but I really did sign an NDA the size of, of the phone book. Uh, oh, I get that. And I just, you know, and 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 I and I did voice to how it's not fair that I'm uh, I'm the one on a podcast and I, I can't say shit, <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> yeah, Thank no. you. No, I appreciate that, and I and no, and you know, um, well, there's two things. One, 
obviously, yeah. I mean, this this represents I, I, this is all editorial. This represents yeah. um, a, a potential shift in the tone of the Marvel movies. I think that most people would say that there the the sea change that we've seen since Iron Man has mostly been positive, and the big difference has been the involvement of people from the comic book side uh, being involved in the movies. That's obviously about to change. I, I, are you even able to say that... It, I mean, it sounded like Civil War was something that the creative panel was involved with. Is Doctor Strange the last production that you guys were involved with? Are you able to even tell me that? Uh, no, I don't think I am. <laughs> okay. No, but, uh, no, not, uh, well, I, you know, that, no comment think, is a think, fair answer. And I'm thinking you know. back to what we talked about. I do think I, I do have talked about we were involved in, in – in, yeah, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. <laughs> I'm well, just, you know, I'm honestly – stop. I'm just well, and full, full disclosure, honestly, and uh, unless unless you know, I get some legal thing saying that I can't, and I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, there will be a word balloon episode that might be kind of a Zapruder film where we're going to like, I'll probably edit together just various you know things about the creative panel because much like the creative summits for the comics, it was just interesting conversation and. Um, history will someday tell the story of how much involvement there was by this panel during this period and truly when this period ended. So, and, if, and, and you know, hey, I, I hope things do relax, and if you are able to talk well, about I, 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 Truthfully, you know, maybe, maybe in a month we can talk yeah. more openly. I just... Uh, sure. There's uh, that, too. You know what I mean? And I, and I hope... Because, yeah. you know, I like to talk about this stuff, and... and uh, I do. Um, but in this instant, it, it is literally not mine to talk about. It is, it's, as, it, it's as egregious of me as, as talking about the, the spoilers in someone else's book. It is just not mine to talk about. So, I hear you, man. So I, 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 um, just, you know, funny, it, I just, you know, I, I do, I, it, it's funny how it becomes telephone and it'd be, it, it, like the story that was reported isn't enough. So people add things onto it, like, uh. Uh, I, I heard Axel murdered Brian, you know, so uh, <laughs> it, it, and, 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 it, and it's weird to hop online and see a narrative being displayed. And then my actual life uh, is not that. So that's weird. You, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm sorry. And I, yeah, I, no, no, I, 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 I'm, yeah, no, I, I'm, again, I, everyone saw it. So it's not like no one knows what we're talking about. Um, but that's that. All right. Yeah, that was so disappointing to you. You thought you were going to get a scoop. No. No, no. Right. No, I was hoping, it, you know, uh, more just in terms of, like I said, I, I just, I, I, I think that uh, we all felt, again, I, I think for the most part, because, yeah, there are people that might have had certain problems with certain movies or whatever, but I, I just, I believe that... Uh, the creative panel was a positive thing, just like uh, having Jeff Loeb in charge of Marvel Television is a positive thing, because it's it's people who understand the characters. Yeah. And I think that, you know, God, I just talked to Rob Meyer Burnett, um, who made that William Shatner comedy, Free Enterprise, kind of making fun of the Star Trek fans. Eric McCormick from Will and Grace was in it. Um, and Rob is one of those guys making this Star Trek fan film, and um, not the one with Chekhov, the other one. And um, he was telling me that, you know, for the longest time, Paramount did not want Star Trek fans working on Star Trek because they felt they were too close to the material. It's so and it, was, yeah, it yeah. really wasn't. What's that? It's so funny. I've heard this before. Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah. And it really wasn't until that last season of Enterprise that they kind of let. Um, and I always forget who the showrunner was. Is it Tracy Torme? I don't know. I think it was. He went, later was on uh, CSI, and I, I forget the which. No, Manny, Manny uh, Cotto. Manny Cotto. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's a showrunner that people might know. And um, he uh, also did Odyssey 5. But anyway, he was a Star Trek fan, and they were some of the best Enterprise episodes because it tied into the lore, and it was obvious that he understood the, the universe and really brought the, you know, and had other writers that, that you know, felt the same way. Yeah, so, I, I always, there was, you know, years ago, um, probably more than I care to admit, John Byrne had that whole, it, there's too many fans working at Marvel like we're just fanboys, and they weren't real Marvel comics. And I was, I was like, well, weren't you that? I mean, what? 
Right. Well, well, you weren't you a fan of Kirby, and that's why, like, it like isn't the line very clear that you were a fan and wanted to do it for a living? So why was it okay for you and not for us? It was a weird, it was a weird insult. Like who? who yeah, Jemis, talking? I know. Jemis, I think when he took over, had that kind of sentiment. As I well, remember, a little bit. I actually this one I know a little bit more about. Yeah, please. But Bill, Bill, and I and I would have been in a room with Bill where Bill very happy with me and Mark. And he would, out loud, try to formulate how to reproduce us. You know, like, like, like I was this perfect mesh of Marvel fanboy and indie comics guy and, mm-hmm. you know, diehard craftsman, like obsessed with craft, right? And then and Mark was like this anarchist. Uh, who loved heroes? You know, it was like this mix of things that he would want to like reproduce in a laboratory uh, out, out of other creators or something. It was really funny, and I and I felt he was, and I I told him this at the time. I go, you're like Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind. You're like reaching for numbers in the sky that none of us can see, and trying to make something that you can't make. You know what I mean? And uh, and you're driving yourself insane trying to do it. So it, 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 it was it was more like that than anything. Like he he didn't want he didn't want he didn't mind fan fans of the of the characters, but he didn't want you you did, that wasn't the only requirement. He wanted more things out of you, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, and so that it was more like that. But the but the insult thrown at like people who make comics, um, they're just fans. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I I think that's a really good news. Like, wouldn't you want fans? Of course. Of yeah, course. but uh, but but I do I do agree with Bill's thing where it has to be uh, love of to not just it, it's a love of character. Do you love the character or you love the character of your childhood? Because the, to the characters have to stay alive; they have to keep moving and changing and evolving. And uh, if you're just repeating things from your childhood, then they're probably going to just be crappy comics. You know, a, a, a shadowy version of something you really liked. So, that, sure. that, and that's always, you know, there's this thing that we have to fight against. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's. Um, I mean, even in my early days on Daredevil, the, the instinct to just do Frank Miller is overwhelming because you loved it so much, and then, and then you you remind yourself, no, what you liked about it is that he 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 went off the rails and tried something else. So that's what you should do if you really are a fan. You should do what he did and not imitate him, but do your own version of taking it to that other place. So um, that that's that big mixture. And I know you're getting back to what I know we're derailing again because you're talking about totally. that the creative committee was this um, or may still be this uh, brain trust of uh, of um, people who really give a shit. And uh, yes. uh, on that level, I can tell you wholeheartedly. Uh, I enjoyed every single second um, of our time because it w- it was that it was uh, it was a, a brain trust of people who really give a shit and aren't afraid to speak their mind and um, yeah and I, and I told you personally for me personally uh, I think I'm more successful in my life because of my time there I've learned from many 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 people and watched. Many many people behave in an, in an environment that was inspiring, and like, all right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be classy like that motherfucker, you know. It just in and I, when you see certain uh, creatives taking notes in a certain way with class and stuff, it, it's very inspiring to me. It reminds me to behave that way. Because like, like like notes is an example. Like getting notes from people, it can be hard. You know what I mean? Like, sure. it, it's it's just it's, your, it's critique. It's it's difficult, and and there is ways to handle it. And um, even the coolest cucumber can crack under it. Uh, but when you see people just being cool, you just remind you look look how cool that looks. You know what I mean? Even if they go home and like beat their dog from the stress, I, I uh, it's it's cool to watch it. And I'm not, by the way, I don't go home and beat my dog. I'm saying when you see something cool, they're like. <laughs> The hamster, I however, I used to beat anybody. Anyway, Whiskers used to have three hands. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. All right. Nice. 
Well, you know, um, it's so it's you just, can't. Just, I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try one more question, and, yeah, you, or at least you keep maybe I'm gonna try one. And you can keep huh? you can stitch together a sentence using all the words I've said to make exactly. sure whatever you want. It to say. <laughs> Hi, hey, hi, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> folks. Anyway, I don't like venom. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I mean, again, you know, we had a conversation, and people are going to hear it at the end of this this specific part of the conversation, because we recorded a month ago, and then we got busy, and we had to stop. Yeah. And uh, when uh, when we were talking then... So if, if all of a sudden we sound a month younger, you'll know. Yeah, and we will, and much more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we, uh, I, no, well, I, I was thinking that I, I, I didn't sound in as good a mood as I actually was when we recorded last time. So I, I think I actually sound in a better mood today. I think. Good. I'm, I'm teasing. I no. Um, no, but honestly, well, my point is, um, you talked about um, the Netflix uh, Jessica Jones show. Yeah. Are you able, are you able to say anything about? I, I you know they've made a bunch of casting announcements on Luke Cage. You know, is have you had any cursory involvement with the Luke Cage stuff? No, nope. no, I, I don't. Um, I you know just when I hear my friends talking about. Stuff they're doing, uh, but I, I don't know. I'm working on powers. It's um, right, right. I don't. Uh, I don't have anything to do with it. It looks exciting. I, you know, we've seen Daredevil. I've seen some of Jessica. They're both right. great. We'll talk about that. I'm yep. looking forward to Luke Cage being great. Nothing would make me happier on the planet Earth than a really good Luke Cage show. Yeah, we all and know also, you're a big Luke Cage fan. It is also like. In a million years, did you think we'd get a Luke Cage show? Like, like when oh. you saw, like when you saw the casting announcements today, weren't you like, mm-hmm. "Oh my God, we're getting, we're getting Misty Knight." Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and also I love that Rosario's coming back as Night Nurse. You know, oh, or whatever. Yeah, she is. yeah. I hope, I hope, so yeah, no, technically not Night Nurse, but we think she's Night Nurse. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. She, she, what? Yeah. Do they? Do they say she's something else? Yeah, I, and I forget the specifics, but yeah, that I think technically maybe the potential for a different character to be Night Nurse is still out there. I but, don't know, but you know. I always have this, you know, it's funny because um, getting back to the question that you're really asking, there's this, um, uh, some people, and, and I totally understand, don't totally get where I'm at with all this stuff, Like, and mm-hmm. some people think I'm involved in every single facet of every single project and production, uh, which I've, I've said on this program is not true. Um, m- many times I, 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 I can't stand people who take credit or give the illusion of credit for something they don't do. So I try to make it very clear what everyone's jobs are. Uh, and I, I know it's made all the more complicated because it's Jessica Jones and, you know what I mean? Like things that, that, that are, um, that I'm known for. So, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't work on the Netflix shows right now. Who's not, who's not to say that is something will happen down the line where I will. Um, but right now I, I do not. And, um, I'm working on my own show. So. Okay. I'm, I just know again, in your, in your role in the, on the creative panel and everything, if yeah. that also well, involved, uh, just, you know, even looking at, hey, this is what we're thinking, you're, you know, you got a second to give us any thoughts. And again, not maybe even official notes, but just even that cursory as a creative, I, I, you know, like, like under, as Joe does as creative consultant of Marvel, and I don't know how this all impacts Joe's job, obviously. Well, he's the sir of Marvel Disney. It's a quite different, he's an executive of, of the corporation. Um, so, say, I, say I, that again, I, I, uh, you had a digital glitch there, so okay, no, yes. So, Joe, Joe is Joe is the chief creative officer of Marvel Disney. He is an executive of the corporation. I'm a uh, freelancer with benefits. <laughs> is uh, is uh, there's a, quite a difference between uh, where we are the, in the spectrum of things. So, uh, like I run the, I run the company, and one of the co- things the company does is uh, uh, d- do services for Marvel Comics. You know, and and Joe is an officer of the of of Disney. Okay, so your capacity your capacity on the Marvel Creative uh, Committee was a different uh, aspect of your deal as a freelancer to Marvel. Your your yeah, however your business like an, doing business with Marvel. It's in addition to my exclusivity 
Uh, and there's other things too that people don't know about. Um, and again, because of non-disclosure agreement, it has to stay that way. There's there's uh, things that I offer Marvel um, in, front, in, in part of my exclusivity, all of which I really like doing. Now, what you're what you're feeling here is um, the, the 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 real rub of my life, the real twilight zoney thing is that I yes, do I know a lot of cool shit that you don't know? <laughs> Absolutely, I know <laughs> all kinds of cool shit. Now, the bummer is I can't tell anybody, like close friends, I can't tell the cool shit. And then it gets announced and they look at me like, oh, you fucked your set on that for six months. So it is um, the, 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 the rub, as they say, is that I know all this cool stuff and I can't tell anybody, including my wife. But she doesn't know who Cottonmouth is, so I don't think she would even have cared if I told her who was cast as Cottonmouth. <laughs> Terrible. He got. Uh, he, got he said uh, there was a Cottonmouth got uh, cast today. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah. I'm not just pulling that. Out. I'm not pulling that out of my ass. <laughs> that's where Luke Cage is. All right, fantastic. Yeah, well, there was tons of Luke Cage news today, actually. Well, that's why. I, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't keep up with all of it either. But I, I, uh, I was happy with what I saw. And um, no, like I said, I mean, they, Luke they, uh, uh, they announced the that. Um, that they they cast Blake Tower in the Daredevil show. All kinds of announcements. Which one's Blake Tower? Is that the actor? Uh, no, Blake Tower is the character, a district attorney, a district attorney for New York City who helps Daredevil. He's from the, he's God, from the comic. Who's, who's, who's running? Is that a Denny O'Neill character? Who is that? Uh, I don't remember. It might be. Yeah. I, you know, I thought I, I, I thought I knew my Daredevil. I'm like, what? Well, this is, I, I will listen. I, as a former writer of Daredevil, I'm telling you, this is, uh, this is uh, deep tracks. That's is, is what they say. Yeah, clearly. This is going in the going deep, deep. Which I well, like. I like when they go deep. That's been the fun of the films and the TV and the follow through from comics to TV to film. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's. I, I, there's, yeah, obviously, I mean, that's the thing, I, I, I understand the speculation, and also I, I also understand that, you know, Marvel is preparing on how to, you know, explain, if they, if they need to, what this means moving forward, because I'm sure these questions will pop up in other forums, I'm sure Axel's next CBR thing will likely, you know, have something on this. I, yeah, and again, you know, there's always going to be that weird thing. For many years to come, um, people are, I don't know if people are going to be aware of, uh, um, yeah, here it is. Hunger Games actor uh, Mahamarshala Ali casts his cottonmouth in Marvel's Luke Cage. <laughs> Great. See? <laughs> so there you go. All right. I'm not I haven't watched the, I only saw the first Hunger Games. I'm like, all right, whatever. Good luck with that. You're not a you're not a twelve year old girl. What? You're not a twelve year old girl. Yeah, well, that's why I said, which is more than I did with Twilight. So exactly. <laughs> Listen, if you get a chance, the Twilight movies with riff tracks are brilliant. It's probably, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, probably the Mystery Science Theater guys versions of Twilight are, are just wonderful. I, I that was the only one I watched Transformers. Yep. And they had they had you know. Uh, Paramount in association with Hasbro Productions and Tom Servo goes, that's all the Academy needed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> that and of course their Daredevil uh, commentary and uh, when uh, What's-Her-Face says, uh, Jennifer Garner says, my name is Electra Nachos and, they, <laughs> and they're like, your name is Electric Nachos? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daredevil is one of my favorite riff tracks. That is, yeah. that is, that is a great one. I'm, you know, I'm much more gentle about uh, the uh, the uh, Coolio uh, version of the film, the, the director's cut. Uh, I still haven't seen it. I got to tell you, I, I I really think it helps the movie. I, I really well, I, I, I read years ago, and this is before, um, bef- way before there was a creative committee. I had read a draft of, of that Daredevil movie that uh, was a lot of fun to read. Like I really liked it, and. Uh, uh, it didn't. It just didn't translate, um, you know. And they were they were so nice. It was the first time I ever got a shout out in a movie. It was very very sweet. So yeah, you know, that's right. I, it was I was I was torn between 
how happy I was to be mentioned in the movie with my, you know my buddy David Mack and and then um, and, and then it was that movie. But my the point is. You guys were fictitious uh, opponents of Jack Murdoch's. Yeah, and, uh, and for me, I hadn't. I they like it wasn't in the draft of the script I read. They put it in while they were filming, and I just started Daredevil while they were filming, and I, I had done enough on Daredevil to uh, get get the shout out. That was like that was a huge win for me. Like I, sure. they liked my Daredevil enough that I, I I was included on the Frank Miller list. Was like yes. You know, and right. uh, and you know, it was just cool. Absolutely, and then of course the uh, bonus stuff on the uh, DVD. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys, Gene Colan. Yeah, no, John, I believe me, John Romita Senior. I was thrilled to be on that. I was thrilled. Absolutely, man. Yeah, if, no, that if was, you get yeah. DVD, I think it's probably on YouTube. If you get, if you get the, the, right. the Daredevil documentary, it's fantastic. You know, well, this again, Rob Burnett, that tr- the Star Trek guy I mentioned earlier, he used to produce a lot of that stuff. He produced the X-Men ones for the Singer movies and the Aliens movies and stuff. And it's sad. He even said, he goes, you know, with streaming um, and and also that people just want the movie and want the cheapest DVD possible and even Blu-rays. He's like, those kind of special features are going away. They are, but they're they're taking a new form. Um, I was literally just in a meeting as we were discussing how to do some kind of like Talking Dead type of show for powers, like, you know, come here right now and we'll talk about what we just did kind of show. So it, it, it's just changing form as people try to find the best way to, way to do it. And you have no role for Principal Suntress in such an endeavor. In, in what, in, in, in powers? In, in talking powers. I can't, I can't be your, uh, I can't be your Hardwick. I am I'll lose weight. personally <laughs> inviting you. I am Are you really? personally inviting you right here to the funeral of Retro Girl, which Thank I'm you. producing, and where I'm going to attempt to fill some of the pews with uh, with uh, people we love. Oh, so, that's really nice. Do you want to get, do you want to get your ass down to Atlanta? Uh, you are cordially invited, wholeheartedly. Put on your funeral clothes and come on down. How many days do you need me down there? I don't know. <laughs> All right, because yeah, I'll try. All right. That's, thank you. That's Absolutely. very sweet. No, I te- I'm, I'm half teasing. I'm half teasing about talking powers. Only well, half. I was um, uh, <laughs> I was um, going to do it privately, but why not do it on a podcast? <laughs> We're looking for a way to get some of the uh, readers and fans of the show down for the funeral as well. That's awesome. That would be a cool way. It's coming up fast. Yeah. I don't know how successful it will be. In doing that, but I thought that would be a nice, uh, oh my God. a nice tip of the yarmulke to our to our diehards. We're not going to fly anybody in, but <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. No, I understand that, but I, I can I can see what strings I can pull, and if it's you know, God, if you could shoot on a weekend, I could say, oh man, absolutely. Not on a weekend. It's I can Probably play right not. now. Exactly. Never on a yeah. Sunday. I understand. Yeah. Well, Jeep, right? You've taken the winds out of my sails, not being able to talk about any of this movie stuff. I know, uh, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I did. Here's the thing: like, I, I did want to talk to you uh, at length about why I couldn't. Um, no, I, 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 not, it's not a blow off. I'd be happy to discuss no. it. it. It, whatever it is, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. That's the thing. It has zero to do with me on any level. So the stuff I can talk about, if it was me, I would talk to you heartily. This isn't about me, so talking about it is rude. Oh, and I signed an NDA, so it's actually illegal. So there you go. <laughs> All right. There you go, Brian Bendis and Joe Casada conversations uh, from the last 10 years. I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, again, uh, where do we go from here? As uh, they said at the end of the Buffy sing-along musical episode, uh, I don't know. I uh, You know, again, um, we've got... Uh, Disney Plus and uh, Marvel Television moving away from Netflix and moving away from Marvel Television altogether, and uh, everything now being run by Kevin Feige, uh, television, film, and comics. And again, not a bad thing. I'm I'm excited, and uh, I don't know what the future holds, but I think we've got great creative people in line. Uh, You know, Steve Wacker getting his promotion as well. Um, Man, you know, um, I love C.B. Cebulski. All the uh, creative heads at Marvel... Um, I, I'm okay with uh, these uh, changes and moving forward, but we'll see what happens. But I hope you enjoyed that look back, 
and uh, maybe, again, gaining a little perspective of uh, where we've come from in the last 10 years. Today's Word Balloon brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners via Patreon. Thank you greatly for your sponsorship and support, League. If you want to join the cause, Word Balloon is free. It will always be free. But is it worth a dollar a month to you? Is it worth the price of a comic book a month to you? If so, go to the Word Balloon Patreon page, patreon.com slash wordballoon, or click on that Patreon ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. Thank you for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. They are having a great holiday special on their online store. Everything that's there in their online store, half price through the end of the year. We're talking about signed and graded comics, graphic novels, convention variants, everything there. Plus, if you live in the U.S., shipping on orders of $50 or more are free. All you have to do is use the code HOLIDAY at checkout. And this is a great opportunity to uh, purchase some Aftershock product. Give them to your friends. I know that we're, uh, you know, within 48 hours of this release of Christmas. But, you know, hey, man, you know, Christmas, like I say, I claim the month for my birthday. You know, Christmas, you, you do things on the 25th. You do things after the 25th. So this is a great chance to uh, pick up something. You know, hey, also, if you're returning uh, gifts and you've got some extra cash, here's a great way to spend it on some great Aftershock product, things like baby tape from teeth from Donny Gates and uh, Animosity from Marguerite Bennett and Tim Seeley's Dark Red. How about Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis? Mary Shelley Monster Hunter, Abomination, a great book. The Rough Riders hardcover edition of Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Pretty neat stuff, man, from Aftershock Comics. Go to their online store and you'll find great deals. Everything in the online store, 50% off. And then also, if you live in the U.S., free shipping on orders of $50 or more. Use the code HOLIDAY at checkout, but go to their website and see it all, aftershockcomics.com. Thanks again for listening to Word Balloon. Uh, We will continue with our look back at the past decade and some big highlights over the last 10 years from Word Balloon. I am so happy to have been uh, observing what was going on in the comics market and film and television and happy to represent these conversations to you. Until next time, have a great holiday week. Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.